Tom. How are you there? How are you doing, Tom? You doing all right? Yeah, I'm very well. How are you, my friend? I'm doing fine. It's actually still sunny here because we changed the clock a little bit, which meant Sunday was terrible mm -hmm. because the children are like, why are we up at 6 a.m.? And I'm like, but it, it's not 6. It is now. I'm so sorry. Uh, so they've been making us pay for it uh, because it actually, parents will tell you that when you switch the clock, it's like cruel and unusual punishment because the children are like, this is stupid. And we're like, yes, but... We have to do it because if we don't, we'll be late. That's what day. we do. That's what we do, kids. We know what we're doing. Um, so I tell you what, but it is, it's actually been freezing, but then it was warm this evening. So we managed to get by. I like that picture behind you, sir. That's quite nice. I like that very much. Thank you. I like that very much. So creating new societies, organizations, uh, Forrest Landry, I did enjoy the Jim Rutt conversation that he had. And I must say, I really appreciate, I feel like um, Forrest Landry is thinking through the problem. I think very often. Hmm. Now, look, I don't want to be, you know, I... I Sometimes I'm, I don't want to make it sound like other people don't as well, okay? So when I'm talking about Forrest Landry, I don't, I'm not saying other people don't. But the particular nitty-gritty details of organizational structures and thinking through all of that is um, – that's not easy work. And I, and I appreciate him thinking through like he is. I think one of the things I find most impressive about him is how rigorous he is with his – metaphysics and how he like once you sort of become familiar with the patterns of his thought you can really see the way he started with this very sort of basic structure and then he just builds everything on top of it and i think given the the structure being quite dynamic he's able to do a lot with it and i think i'm i'm always impressed by just the way he's able to clarify and sort of enhance the vividness of things by applying that schema to it. Mm. I, I really appreciate a thinker. Um, the conversation of the making of systems in general and the fundamental presuppositions of making systems is something very interesting to me because you know, one of the things that I find like a, a, a fascinating conversation, and it's no hit on Forrest in any way whatsoever, I don't frankly see anything internally incorrect about the system. It all follows, right? So then the, the question is the following, will people do it? Like, how do you motivate people to do a good system, right? Like, do they have the time to do it? Are they motivated to do it? Do they care to do it? If they did it, it would work, but then you have to make them do it. Right. And is it something where it's the pressure of the AI that would make people do it? You know, the other, you know, maybe it is, maybe it's not, or is it too late? Right. There's this interesting problem because, as you know, I'm so concerned about the question of motivation. And the reason I tend to center on motivation is because if you can, in a way, hack motivation, well, then you know things emerge from that. Right. But, you know, Kierkegaard once asked, you know, why be rational? right? You know, why be rational or why do the good? And it's this fundamental problem where you can give people a perfect system, but if they don't have time or they're busy because they got fit, like I always think it's important to think systems from the, the, the time strapped part, like the, the time strapped family, right? Like they have no time. They really don't want to even think about government. Uh, yeah, sure. They could vote in the system if they wanted to, but they don't even have time and they're frankly paying bills and they're trying to spend more time with their kids because they don't have time because they're working all the time. And they're, and it's interesting to me because there's almost a chicken or egg problem um, mm. of what do you put first, the, the system of which all follows or the human condition that doesn't have time even for a perfect system. And then you could say, well, the reason they don't have time is because the system sucks, right? You could make that argument. You say, well, no, it has to be the system because they don't have time because the, e the economic situation is so bad due to having a bunch of people at the top that, you know, since the 70s, the spending power of the dollar has collapsed so nobody has money. So what, what comes first? And that, that to me is a strikingly difficult problem because the economist wants to say that incentives come first. Motivation comes first. But then politically, it's like, no, the political system comes first, actually. And then, of course, the problem is they always emerge together. So is it a chicken or egg? Can you separate economics from politics? Because ultimately, what, you're what he's talking about is political formation, right? Even if you're talking about a business organization, that is a kind of political organization, the politics of the business, how decisions are made. I think this is an insanely difficult question. Uh, because like, 
it, it, and I'm not sure, you know, because for example, there's no reason the system can't work. And there's lots of evidence that many game B setups work, right? But then here's the question. Does it only work because they attract people who are willing to try those sorts of things? Is there a self-selection mechanism? What if you threw it upon the average blue collar truck driver who couldn't care less about philosophical systems and actually doesn't even want to think about it? Like what then? Does that all make sense to you? Because this is where, this is to me like really the difficult part. Like, like what, how do you get the, how do you get the blue collar high schooler who drives trucks to do what Forrest Landry is talking about? Do you, you see what I'm saying? Because that's the problem. But to me, that's what I think about because when he's talking about, because to me, the problem of scale is that. That is the problem of scale. Like, you know, there's a lot of talk of Dunbar numbers and different things. Obviously, that's the case. Obviously, that's because of personality problems. But theoretically, if you had everyone of a similar personality, I would actually argue the Dunbar matter would not really matter that much because they tend to go together. The issue is the probability of having that much similarity through past the Dunbar number is zero, right? Well, that's why totalitarian regimes tried to orchestrate it. Uh, you know, that's why they basically have done that. So there's an issue of a system has to work for someone who doesn't like the system. That's the test. I don't like your system and yet it still works for me. Yeah, that's the ultimate test. The person who doesn't believe in your system, they don't like your arguments, they don't even want to do it, and yet it still benefits them. You see, that's kind of the crazy thing because if, because if you have a system that is internally consistent and totally works, if people do it, that's still a massive contingency. If people do it, right? You see what I'm saying? And that, that's something I think about a lot. And I, and again, I'm not even saying Forrest hasn't thought of that and he doesn't have answers to it. I don't want to say everything I just said in the context that Forrest has not thought about it. Because that's not what I want to do. It's, it's more of that giant framework problem in general. Yeah, I mean, there's sort of already a lot on the table there. And I think this question, the question around governance, and then if we also bring in some of the conversation around the substrate argument for AI, AI and governance, and then smack the digital in between those, like, <laughs> these are the big questions, in my opinion, of right now. Yeah, there's there's so much, but I, I'm, I feel very personally motivated to yeah, really try to chew on these questions because of their deep relevance right now. Excellent. So I think, like, as we know, that kind of uh, causal thinking of what comes first is sort of no longer the paradigm that we're going to be working right. with. And I think Forrest actually said this in that conversation. He talked about in the Paleolithic sort of tribal era, we were working working with nature and flows, which was something like his imminent modality. And now recently we've been working with uh, causality, which I think is more like the omniscient. And now we're moving into a paradigm where choice is primary. And you can kind of like feel that. It's like we are this force of nature that then becomes like conceptually reflective. And then we kind of get this like the AA logic out of that. But now it's kind of like, oh, there's subjectivity and what do we do with that? Right. And that's kind of the question of motivation. And we, we can say off the bat that we know the perfect system does not exist because of the challenge of working with subjectivity, which is somewhat synonymous with motivation. And so I think another thing Forrest says that's really helpful here is he talks about the, the individual scale, which is something like private market, the macroscopic scale which is like top-down governance and then you get this mesoscopic scale which is like community commons and yeah, he talks about it the feels like out kind of thing yes yeah yeah and so to bridge the between the subjectivity and the system or the 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 symbol structure it feels like we need the the intersuppositional layer that can sort of more dynamically work with the symbols in real time in a more process and relational oriented way than as sort of a static structure. And I think what that does for the blue collar worker is he doesn't, he, she doesn't need to necessarily understand the formal logic of the greater system, but through like interpersonal relating can be brought into more of a participatory relationship 
with the values implicit in the bigger structure in a way that feeds in his subjectivity in a way that the market can't do right. for obvious reasons. Excellent. Um, I really appreciate with me, the more I learn about forest work, Mr. Landry, the more I am impressed how everything follows from one another. You know, his metaphysics lead into his social organization and structures and everything feels very carefully constructed. Um, that's 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 very impressive. And I, I've enjoyed that very much. Um, I also feel like he's very open and receptive. Like when he's talking to someone, mm -hmm. he's listening to them. Uh, I, I find that very impressive. I also really felt as if he very well went to great lengths to make sure the question was properly framed. Because if you don't know where you start, you have no idea where you're going, or even if you're starting in the right place, right? And to make sure that real emphasis on the problem of scale, because that is huge. Um, generally speaking, I can't think of any system that couldn't work with the right people, right? Like no matter how bad it is, if you get five people who all want to make it work, they can make it work, right? Uh, whether it be capitalism, communism, Marxism, Lenin, it doesn't really matter. Like at small enough of a scale, you can probably make just about any system work unless it's something in entirely insane, like trying to get my children to share Legos. That will not work, but something other than that may work. Um, but the problem is scale, of course, right? Because as you bring in different personalities, different um, interests, different concerns, that's when stuff can break down. And so often I feel like in the conversation, there's an idea of, oh, this is a good idea. Oh, this is a good idea. This system's a good idea. This system's a good idea. Well, yeah, it, it could be a good idea, but the problem is scale. Like you could have a whole lot of good ideas that would work for maybe middle-class college educated people, but not work for people who are living in Asia, uh, who have different interests, or you, maybe your system assumes the internet, right? Maybe the system assumes the internet. Well, what if you're in a nation that doesn't have the infrastructure for high-speed internet, right? There are all these different kinds of assumptions in the background of what the system requires, right? That doesn't mean the system cannot work or the organization cannot work given those conditions, but if those conditions are not there, it may not work so well. So you have this very severe problem of spread in this very severe um, problem of scale. I, Cause I, 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 I'll conflate those in this conversation, this kind of notion of how you scale and how you spread. And I really appreciated how he was drawing attention to that. And, um, and that to me gets into a whole lot of questions on exactly the, the where one should even start a conversation about organizational design. Um, what's the metric of determining that a system, and I'll use organization system interchangeably, although in other conversations, pe people may not do so. So um, how, what, are, what are the metrics of success, right? Like, how do you determine if an organization is successful? You would say, oh, everyone participated. Okay, everyone participated, but they were miserable as they were doing it and they didn't enjoy being there. Okay, well, is it successful then, right? There are all these different questions. So I really, I really, and then I'll pass it to you. I really just appreciate, I appreciate in his thinking how things follow so logically. And I really appreciated um, him, him focusing on that particular question of scale. I also, before I forget, I appreciated how he's not a mono theorist, meaning there's like democracy works or, you know, um, um, the C word I'm now forgetting, uh, that that works. It's like, no, there are different scales and different levels where different things can work, but it depends on those given conditions. And I think that's important to have a variety, a, a toolbox of different um, pieces that you bring in in different times and different circumstances. So I appreciate that as well in his thinking. Where my mind goes immediately is this sort of radical shift that comes about once you stop searching for the perfect system mm. or the perfect idea um, at, at all of the scales. I think just that sort of logic of assuming that there is going to be some sort of completion achieved through any of these different kind of modes, whether it's symbolic or something more subjective, just sort of realizing that there's always going to be this not quiteness or a sort of space that gets left open that we're going to have to eventually step into. And it almost feels like the where this conversation needs to go around governance can't actually start until it's being had from that place. And I think one of the beauties of this is once you kind of break that lens and perhaps it needs to be broken, not just at the sort of conceptual level, but also break it at the motivational level. 
you sort of start coming at this from a very different perspective. And I, I think it sort of, it starts to take on one, this feeling of impossibility, but also a feeling of freedom within that. And it's sort of like, sort of to drop down into like a real just raw pattern. To me, it's kind of like we, we somehow need to find a way to have everyone like truly participating, whatever that means for them. And any attempt to kind of uh, capture people in something that's going to like impose the ideas onto them and have that as sort of the primary mechanism is ultimately just going to fail and fall apart. But with that being said, we will need some of that because as we've just said, nothing is going to be a perfect solution. And so we're trying to tap into all of these different styles of approaches. And I guess this is where the, b before the conversation began, we were talking about a microscopic, mesoscopic and macroscopic scale and the mesoscopic being sort of community common scale. And to me, that is the scale that will bear the weight of bringing people's motivations online through real relationship. Yeah, I'll stop there for now. No, that that's outstanding. Um, so a few things. Um, so much of this, like when you're talking about this kind of fundamental incompleteness or this by incompleteness, meaning that there is an element that can never be perfect, right? That doesn't mean it can't be um, perfect in the sense of functioning. I think it's very interesting. Like when you go back to Aquinas, if I were, um, he would he would say, if your thumb works, it's perfect because a thumb is made to say, pick up a pen, right? If you can pick up a pen, your thumb is perfect because it's it succeeds in its task. So perfection was relative to task, but then this kind of language of perfection emerged, which was without blemish, without problem, et cetera, so forth. And that's when you get a kind of utopian. Right. And so now when we talk about a perfect system, what we're seeing is we need to mean by that, that it accomplishes its goal. Right. That it accomplishes what it exists to do. Ah, but what does it exist to do, of course? Now, in the past, of course, the, the uh, generally speaking, the point of the system was utopia to make everyone rational, to uh, increase freedom. Right. These kind of ideals are different things. Well, the problem that we found is that designing systems according to metrics like that open a lot of problems. Let's even take freedom. Freedom sounds like that shouldn't be a problem, right? Everyone is free. Well, do you define freedom according to a negative freedom? Found, you know, Isaiah Berlin makes this extraordinary essay where he makes the distinction between positive freedom and negative freedom. The negative freedom means you are left alone to do X. Positive means you are able to do Y. Okay, so let's say mm -hmm. you have the freedom to, you know, you're free, um, you're, you're free to get health care. OK, and you say, well, that should be a freedom, because if you don't have your health, you can't be free. Right. You say that. But here's the issue. In order to have health care, you need a doctor to be able to do the health care to you. Right. You need someone to provide the health care. Right. So that would be a positive freedom for Isaiah Berlin. That doesn't mean it's good or bad. And it's very important. Isaiah Berlin ultimately says the society has to be a mixture of both. So this isn't a hierarchy. A negative freedom is one where you don't need anyone to add anything to you to do it. So like the freedom of speech. Right. I can just speak to you. Right now, I don't have the freedom of audience, meaning I uh, I have a right to an audience, but I have a freedom to speak because, you know, no one has to give me vocal cords or something. So that's a negative freedom. You're just left alone to do whatever. Right. So, of course, if you say the point of the system is to increase freedom, that sounds like it's everyone's just kind of left alone. But then it depends on how you define freedom. Right. And likewise, of course, if you say, oh, the, the system is to make people more rational. According to what truth? According to what worldview, right? So what we've we've kind of at the at this point in, in history, dare I say, we've come to understand that the metrics of a system really cannot be an a ideal, right? It can't be a like an ideal thing. Now you could say it's to make us more human. But you see, there's there's a problem here. That seems to be the close, like if you were to say, well, the point of the system should be to make us more human. Of everything, that seems to be closest, right? But of course, it's not self-evident on what constitutes the human, right? So then should everyone, should the system create an environment where everyone for themselves can define what it means to be human, right? Well, but what if they're, the definitions butt up against each other, right? You have one group over there that defines being human as X, they define it as Y, they contradict, and now they're at war because they believe the other one's immoral. 
according to how they define what it means to be human. And that's what happens generally with religions, right? So what, what happens then is you almost are in a situation where you somehow have to systemize the gap itself. Like the gap, the mm -hmm. system has to preserve the gap as opposed to close the gap. Because if this group over here closes the gap and this group over here closes the gap, well, they're good, they might end up fighting. Right. Because they have different definitions of what of, say, for example, what marriage is or how you should raise children. Right. Well, that leads to conflicts because people think that definition of marriage is immoral and those people think it's moral. And now you have a legal system that's going to have a ruling in the moment the courts say, oh, X definition of marriage is right, not Y. Well, now a group feels infringed upon and there's a revolution that starts to brew. Right. You see how this works. So what would it mean for every tribe to have a gap in their thinking, to leave a certain opening? in their thinking. And actually, an optimal system and an optimal group is one that actually honors the gap, which would, of course, mean a kind of uncertainty, a kind of like, well, we're actually are incomplete, but we need to be open precisely so there's room for the other, right? So that there's room for other views and we're not going to be so quick to shut them down. Um, James Hunter and people like Alice uh, McAllister and Charles, these different people all talk about the need for a substantive democracy or a society where people can have different first principles and not believe that other people having first principles means that they're wrong. So like this is an incredible problem because for me, the question of systems very often has to take on an existential psychoanalyst view, right? If, if you're, say, like a Christian and you have a certain worldview and your neighbor is a Hindu, the very fact that you're a, they're a Hindu means that you're open to the realization that people have different worldviews than you. And just them being there, not doing anything, just existing can make you be existentially reflecting on your worldview and feel uncomfortable. Like, oh, my gosh, maybe I should go over and convince them to be a Christian. And wait a minute, if they maybe if I was born in India, I'd be a Hindu, too. Oh, my gosh, how do I know? if Ah, and, and then you start going down that spiral, right? What would it mean to have organizations and systems that help people live with that uncertainty? Actually help them see it as a creative opportunity where you feel that tension and it's like, oh, well, what kind of interfaith dialogues would be possible or interfaith um, connections or relationships or products could happen that couldn't happen otherwise, right? That's a very radically different way to approach difference because we tend to approach difference as bad, right? But what would it mean to look at difference as something creative? And what would it mean to have organizations that would help um, people handle that difference, live with that difference, and think through that difference, right? I think that's going to be incredibly important, too, that kind of question as AI develops that Mr. Landry has also talked about. Because if AI is able to basically do anything rational better than human beings can do it, then we certainly can't think of ourselves as a rational animal so much because the AI does that better and now we don't have a place, right? So if we use Aristotle's definition of to be human is to be a rational animal, then the AI doesn't give us much of a place, right? But what if we were to figure out how to be a creative animal and actually the material of our creativity is difference? Like difference itself, which would be relation and being in relation with difference. And the only way you can even have relation is with difference, because if everyone's the same, there is no relation because they're the same. Relation requires difference. And I know in Mr. Landry, relation is so primary. What would it mean to, as human beings, view themselves as relational beings and have the organization help people come to terms with that? And to think what it means to live according to that to create different communities, right? And that starting to get at, for me, what, it, what, what should the metric be of organizations in a pluralistic world? Because I think that's what you have to think. Like, you can't say, oh, like, we're going to make a system or a government body that's going to be really efficient and have new ways of interacting with one another. Yeah, it doesn't matter how good it is if people can't handle the existence of difference. Like, if they can't handle the fact that their neighbor is a Hindu while they're a Christian and that makes them uncomfortable, if they can't handle that or see that as somehow good even, Here's the thing. We don't view like anxiety as a good thing. What if you could view the anxiety of difference that everyone feels in difference? I don't care how much they say they like difference. No one actually likes difference. No one. No matter how much they talk about liking difference, the encounter of true difference tends to be destabilizing, right? A lot of times when people talk about diversity, um, yes, there are different ethnicities, but they tend to all go to the same college or have similar backgrounds or think similarly. No, no, no. Deep difference is very hard. How can deep difference become something that motivates 
energizes and doesn't exhaust people because that's generally what occurs is the very knowing that people have different views and are different is existentially exhausting to people. And then everyone feels like they have to think of big questions and what they want. And they're just trying to pay their bills, right? And they don't even want to think about all these different things. And so what would it mean? And what would it mean to have organizations have people carry themselves in a manner where they viewed relations with difference, not people similar to them, but with difference as good and opening doors as opposed to an inconvenience to their worldview? Um, that to me is the sociological trick. That's the difficulty because if, because otherwise, well, what did they do in the past? Basically, like when you had the Huguenot, the Huguenots just went to America. Like people got in a ship and went away from the difference when the Catholics or Pro Protestants are fighting. We can't do that anymore. Like going to some isolated tribe somewhere and just being around people who get your system or get your civilization model and think similar enough to make it work. That's not really on the table. And if it is on the table, that's isolationist, right? And I don't deny that an isolationist model can't work. Of course it can work. I mean, it can certainly work. But the question is, how do you have an organization that is not isolationist, that is interconnected, and yet has people understand those same metrics? Those are things I think about. And it, to me, it's kind of a broader, it's like whatever the conversation goes, it has to somehow make the average person experience difference as a blessing. And by difference, I mean the existential feeling that difference causes. No one is going to say that, you know, that difference directly is bad, but they literally do feel that way. And they will quietly and silently withdraw all while they tell you that they like difference. They'll stop interacting with it, or they'll think in a manner of which blocks out difference um, you know, that, a good example of this is college educated people tend to block out people they think have a lower IQ, right? You know, they'll block them out by designing a system that you have to have a certain IQ level to even be able to handle, right? There's nothing that directly only makes the system apply to college educated people, but indirectly it has mechanisms of self-selection that then makes it uh, seem like the system's great because look, all the it works so well. Yeah, but only under the conditions of self-selection, right? Um, and th so those are the things that I initially think about in this conversation and in, in organizational design. Difference seems to be a encounter with the depths of our biology, mm. sort of the the cognitive machinery, the, the predictive processing we're actually wired to respond to difference in that way. And so if we want to build a culture or generate a spirit that is able to be with difference, it's going to require a lot of healing, mm. a, a lot of resilience. And I think a, a lot of this will only come through relational fields. I, I think eventually we have to sort of construct some sort of symbolic order that has this built into it. And maybe that's sort of more of a starting point. We're definitely seeing that in this conversation, for example, we're agreeing upon the need for difference as a proposition, but it seems to be the, that mesoscopic scale where we can construct these relational fields that will enable people to be ensouled a mm. sort of safe enough. You can't, you can't start with difference off the bat. You right. kind of have to like, if someone doesn't have that like real deep intrinsic desire to go out and sort of confront difference, which would be kind of someone who's maybe, I don't know, like a, an adventurer or an explorer or, or someone who really has something to prove. But if you don't have that, then you don't want to just throw people into that difference. They kind of need okay. to be, a lot of the reason they're reacting to the difference is because of their pain, because of their past encounters with difference that have set up this relationship with the other as a negative encounter. And so to bring people in and to make them feel safe and seen and understood, and then through that process, through a, through, through a process of trust and intimacy, gradually expo exposing them to difference in a way where they can learn for themselves all the way down the stack that there is actually a value in difference, which is the value that it perpetuates life and creation and change. But to really have that as a learned experience. And I, I think this is kind of the, the problem that we're both zeroing in on is 
like doing that at scale is going to require a lot of really motivated people who are really willing to contend with the, the intensities of what it means to come into those relational spaces with people. Because in, in, in a sense, it's a very thankless job, although you can derive a real sense of meaning from it. The, the chance of those kinds of fields exploding and the kind of relational fallout that is at stake when you are truly in that space uh, is that it's sort of like the chances of you getting traumatized when trying to help someone who is traumatized is much higher than the chances of you sort of supporting them and finding their own relationship with difference. Mm. And it feels like it really has to sort of like, okay, bring someone into their pain, like really get them in soul to the point where they're really understanding sort of their own narrative, like why they are the way they are. And then as they're coming in touch with that, within themselves, it sort of feels like simultaneously their own drive and love towards life will be found within that. And as soon as they're able to contact that part of themselves, that will be the force that will be sufficient for bringing them into right relationship with difference. That's right. And I, I think maybe one challenge with thinking about it that way is I think it's very easy to slip into a model where you don't accommodate like a true victim, like so, for example, someone who maybe can't, I don't know, someone who's facing like a genuine disability. I think we have to be careful not to sort of build these kind of uh, relational field models where we expect everyone to come out as a sort of Nietzschean like warrior who's going to then confront the difference. And so it's sort of like what maybe a question, what does difference mean for someone who is like truly being traumatically undermined by the difference to the point where it would almost be just deeply unrealistic to expect them to be able to relate to it, at least at this point in their life. Excellent. A uh, few things. First, one of the things I appreciate about Miss Landry's work is the emphasis on dealing with traumas, communication dynamics, these inter like these kind of what are the even establishing sort of the rules and guidelines of interaction, because a lot of times people overlook those I almost want to say meta dimensions, you know, these meta guidelines, it's nothing concrete and yet it's very concrete. Um, if, if you come up to a chair and there's a coat draped over and it's very concrete that someone is using that chair and yet there's no law anywhere written that says you can't sit there. And if you sit in that chair, it's kind of concrete that you're a, you're a jerk. You stole someone's chair, right? It's not. And, and actually I was taught um, Sam at Greener side, whose readings of Kafka are just extraordinary. Like one of the ways to think of the trial. Um, and we were talking about this is that, like the, the crime Joseph K. breaks, he's not sure what crime he broke, is he keeps breaking these social norms that aren't a law written anywhere, but if you break them, you're like the worst person and like people are gonna like throw you under a bus, right? So you're like, how, you're, how can you take that person's chair? So there are these meta rules that are arguably more important than official rules, actually, uh, because they are calibrating and organizing the constant interaction that you're doing with all the time. I, uh, I don't tend to talk to the police officers too often or read the official law too often, but I am very often thinking in terms of social norms, social interactions when I go to the store, when I'm at work, and yet all of these things are invisible. And so the attention that Mr. Landry brings to that, I think is very important because most, in my opinion, most systems design does not think about that. They think about the concrete rules, the concrete mechanisms, but they don't include in their definition of the concrete, the meta dimensions, which actually are just as concrete. Uh, and if you don't think of those, the whole thing will fail. Uh, so thinking about those conversation dynamics, I think is extremely important. A few more things. Um, when I talk about the difference, it should be noted that a reason why, say, it doesn't seem as if freedom can be the, the sole value is because if you introduce the difference of the negative freedom to the positive freedom, they cancel each other out. Right. So that's the reason why that that is the prime value doesn't seem to work so well. Likewise, you, you could say equality. The problem with equality is by who decides what is the definition of equality. If you introduce a different definition of equality, they necessarily conflict. Right. Because my definition is equal opportunity. Your definition is equal result. Those can't go together. Right. So they, they contradict. So a system that makes space for the difference is one that can introduce would mean that it consists of variables that can encounter the difference and not cancel each other out. 
Okay, well, that's tricky. What is that exactly? What exactly is um, what exactly is a principle or notions or whatever that can introduce their difference and not in that find conflict? Because, because in addition to people being able to do that, the metrics of success themselves have to be able to do that. Like what you are striving to optimize to, right? So that's one thing. And another reason why this is very important is because whatever system you design, it only will, it's only as good and can only as scale to the degree that it can benefit the person who thinks it's stupid. Like if your system only benefits people who like it and who are involved in it, then it is inherently limited in its scale, right? Like if, if you hate capitalism, you can still go to Starbucks. Like Starbucks doesn't vanish and fail to be there even if you hate capitalism. Now, Obviously, if the high majority of people hate capitalism, the entire socioeconomic order will collapse or change, not collapse. It might just change. But the point is that there's a whole lot of people, millions of people who can dislike the system and yet still use the roads, still go to the stores. And not until it gets to maybe 80 percent of people does it like stop functioning or something. Right now, I'm not necessarily making a defense of capitalism. I'm just making the point that capitalism tends to be able to work just fine with a ton of people who don't like it and benefit those people, even if they don't know they're benefiting from it. Like if theoretically someone like Hike and Momensis is correct about the pricing mechanism and capitalism creating the wealth, Dietrich Mikowski, it's able to create wealth for people who don't obliged by it, who don't like it, right? You don't have to like capitalism to be able to, to benefit from it. Do you see what I'm saying? And the system will not collapse until a very high percentage of people no longer play by the rules, if you will, or operate to it, right? So if you have a system that's not able to do that, if it can only benefit people who, if it can only benefit people who understand it, who like it, and who agree to it, that's probably not the answer. Right. Because the ultimate difference for a system is the person who hates the system. Like you could almost kind of hone the conversation on that. Right. Because we've talked about difference and you could talk about it in like a pluralistic sense. But in a system sense, the ultimate difference a system has to incorporate is the person or people who don't like the system or who don't understand the system or who don't even follow the dynamics of the system. Right. And that's where it gets very tricky. Because if, if indeed it seems like we have to have certain conversational dynamics for politics to work, well, does that mean the people who don't understand those dynamics or follow the dynamics then can't benefit from the system? And if you say yes, that could be an issue because the probability of, say, educating or getting the majority of people to agree to those dynamics is probably quite low, right? So now we have an inherent scale problem. And I do think to me, if I were to frame it, and I'll pass it back to you. One, we could argue that there is no system that can scale adequately. And that would be the end of conversation, right? Everyone just makes their tribe and whatever works for their personality group, so on and so forth, right? And I actually don't even, like there are enough different people making different small group societies and tribes to take care of that. There's a lot of people who have thought very hard about that. Mr. Landry is an example, right? I see, you know, you, you could just follow that. There's, there's those groups in Germany doing different things. So we definitely have small scale models, right? I don't, I don't, I, I think people have done that work. As far as I can tell, they seem to work fine <laughs> for the people that do it, right? So that's not the conversation because I think that's basically taken care of. Now you could say that they're not going to, they're not going to stop global. You could say, well, the problem is Dan, those, yeah, those work, but they're not going to stop global warming. Okay. Well, okay, so that's the Daniel Slyamaka meta question, right? So the first argument would say, okay, yeah, that works, Daniel. But the problem is that that system will not stop the meta crisis. Okay, well, that means we have to focus on what we're talking about, which is the issue of scaling, okay? So you need to scale a different global system, et cetera, if you're going to deal with the meta crisis. Now, you could argue the meta crisis doesn't exist, I guess. You could take that route if you wanted, and you could make that argument. But assuming it does exist, then the question of scale is paramount, okay? Does that make sense? So for scale to work though, the system has to benefit people who disagree with the system. That would be the ultimate other and the, the ultimate difference. And that would be the gap. You see what I'm saying? Like that would be the gap in the system, the people who refuse to benefit it, of which then would probably be at a larger system scale, similar to some sort of gap in the subject themselves, 
like the, the inability of the subject to complete themselves, of which would be represented similarly in the system, and yet the system could still operate with that gap. And then the metrics of that system to determine if the system is working would simultaneously be metrics that can incorporate difference and not be destroyed. So that seems to be what it has to happen on all of those levels. Now, I just said a whole lot. If none of that makes sense, please tell me. But that's how I'm thinking about it right now. Yeah, no, great. It sparks a lot. Um, yeah, so two things are coming to mind immediately. What would it mean to have leadership that were conscious of the fact that they weren't the one? So leaders who actually recognize that they are not the thing that they are being symbolically represented as. Because that just that off the bat creates uh, something qualitatively different. And then maybe as part of that, like what does it mean to have a group of people around the leadership that also recognize that those leaders are not the symbol, but also subjects with their own shortcomings and their own in incompleteness that's a big ask but it's an interesting place to start and that to me sort of points to a sort of generalized realization of difference in all of these different places in leadership in the system and then then there's the question of can the system become conscious of the role of the marginalized? And can it even perhaps like build a relationship with the, with the, the group that are being sort of uh, excluded by the system? Can there be an actual explicit mechanism that no longer sees them as a antagony, but rather as a portal? into into the next world i mean just sort of feeling into those two things immediately it's like okay wow that's you're now working with something very different than the the current which is kind of like the exact opposite of that where the people that are the leaders are not all of them but a lot of them are sort of deifying themselves and then the people around them are deifying them and then anyone that is opposing that system for its shortcomings are going to be seen as the problem and so it's kind of like okay what happens if that all gets inverted but then we come back to the question of to invert that means to descend to the depths of our biology and perhaps even like our our ontology and really realize the fact that we are hardwired to do these things and and in part for a good reason like we don't want to get rid of that machinery that machinery is what is enabling us to orient ourselves um yeah and then there's this thought there's something about being able to move between these scales so the the individual subjective the the interpersonal and then the like systemic symbolic something about like actually prioritizing the movement between them rather than trying to like concretely figure out any one of them and kind of like committing yourself to a not knowing, but rather engaging in the process of like, okay, now I'm at the individual level. What do, what's, what's choices do I need to make in order to further my becoming? And then moving out to the interpersonal, it's like, okay, how is that relating to the, the individual? And then kind of shifting out into the system and looking at what's emerging there. And it's sort of like, I think one of the things, and this ultimately comes back to difference, but one of the things we're going to really struggle with is just realizing how much uncertainty we have to be with in order to make this work. And, and I think where we can find certainty is actually in the security and freedom found in choice. And this, this is coming back to Forrest now. He's sort of making a great effort to bring choice front and center love is that which enables choice nature and flow and then more recently we've shift to a mode of causality and now we're shifting into a mode of choice as primary and i think what choice enables it is it enables a high degree of certainty at the level of the immediate 
which then allows for the complexity to continue to remain whole with all of its, all of its potential. And I, I think effective choice as a sort of primary schema allows for the constant emergence of what needs to happen at these different scales in relationship to one another. Um, a few things. Um, I meant to mention this. You were pointing out um, what about the individual incorporating into the system of a certain trauma and a certain difficulty and different things like that. How would you bring them in? Um, one of the things that I think is very important for any organizational or systems thinking is that you make sure that the person you have in mind participating in that system is not, say, the single person who's in their mid-20s that, uh, that is eager to participate. Because, it, because you're, the, the, the nature of the subject that you are thinking participating in your system may create an impression that something will work that won't work. Now, I'm not, I don't have any one in mind, and I, I want to stress, I was extremely impressed with Forrest Landry's system and his working, and I see no reason why it cannot work and actually prove optimal to what is currently existing. So that's not, that's not what we're talking. Um, the issue is that in Mr. Landry, there is an emphasis on like conversational dynamics and the interpersonal, right? And there seems to be a um, teaching of people to carry themselves in a certain way in the system, right? That's what I think we're homing in on, right? Can the system do that too? Because I, I don't know about that. It didn't seem like Mr. Landry was saying that the system could train people to be the subjects that can handle the system. Now, maybe or maybe not. And that's where I'm going to back off. I don't, I'm not making a hard claim on his work. I've not read everything by Mr. Landry. I enjoyed the Jim Rutt uh, podcast that I've listened, some of the stuff, you know, the voice craft that Tim has done. So not making those claims. And he also, in a fascinating way, he, he suggested with Mr. Rutt, that although you have the problem of scale up to 200, around 200, you can start systemizing again as long as you don't exceed. So there's something there in his thinking that is, is quite fascinating that should be explored for it. But that all aside, there's this question of, of being the kind of subject that can handle the, the system, right? And so for me, when you think of systems design, you always want to think of who I consider to probably be generally the average, uh, the average of people of whom are kind of, I don't want to say most important, but probably most important for the continuation of your society. And I am biased because I'm a parent, but that's going to be the time-strapped parent with kids who don't, who have no time. Like they are just running at the top of their limb to, to feed, take care of the children. They do not have time. They don't have time to think about these matters, to read up on political matters. Like they're, they're, they're strapped. And even like coming down to a meeting to talk about an issue for 30 minutes is a huge ask uh, because they'd have, someone has to watch the kids. Someone doesn't have to watch it. Like there's all of those different things. So for me, and likewise, the person who has a trauma that the last time they tried to join an organization, they were made to feel like they're worthless and they have nothing to contribute. So they have a lot of pain when it comes to being part of any group size. What about that person? And I really do think you need to like, like for me, you basically want to think of the person who doesn't have any time. Like think about that person. How would the person who has zero time basically participate in your system? Uh, because that is the person who you've got to address because because basically everyone today feels like they don't have time, right? Like they, they don't have time. They, even if they do, they don't feel like they do. And especially the parent probably doesn't just with, or, or not much. It's a, it's a big deal. And a lot of marriages can get very tense, just simply making time so that the husband or the wife or whatever can do something with the kids. It's, it's a big issue. And if that personal dynamic has to be explored every week to participate in the system, that's probably not going to work so well. Or you'll have, you know... A lot of people won't make the meetings. Well, if they don't make the meetings, well, then they're gonna, not going to feel represented and it's not their fault, right? Because, you know, they weren't able to be one of those five people in that group or different things. So this is, to me, and I'm not saying that Forrest doesn't think about that. And even Mr. Rudd, I've heard many times say that your game B thinking um, must put childbearing and families first. So again, no one's talking about them and um, not, not that necessarily Forrest associates with game B. I'm, I'm not sure about that, but he's definitely doing systems design thinking, organizational design thinking. So you have to think of that person, right? Not think of the eager, excited to experience. And again, you don't want to think of the person who's eager to try new systems design. Okay, well, they're open to experimentation and failure. 
you you want to think about the person that if you screw up screw up once they're done you're like okay this this is stupid i'm out you know or you don't have a good pitch i'm out not the person who's like oh it's cool let's do a new experiment it's fun to try new things that personality type is going to give you a lot of room to figure stuff out but a lot of people aren't that way so you have to think about the people who are closed off to experimentation right um that's very difficult. Um, so a few things um, as well. Uh, so a lot of what seems to be going on in the conversation is the problem of the subject themselves, the way that the person is, right? But of course, there's a ditch here because if you say, well, if everyone was just, you know, smarter, then we'd all be good. Or if everyone had a more open personality type, then it would work. Yeah, the problem of scale would not be a problem if we could just simply say, click. That's it. Everyone needs to be more rational. Ah, we tried that. That's called modernism. Gave us totalitarianism. Not so great. So that's not the way. So you can't, so when we're talking about, what's interesting here, when we're talking about some sort of way of the subject, way of the leader, it doesn't seem like it can be a single principle. Like, oh, they need to be more open. Oh, they need to be more rational. Oh, they need to be more creative because those all seem to be characteristics. And once you start saying there's a certain characteristic of a subject we need to reify or whatever, well, now you're in totalitarian land, right? So that doesn't seem like it needs to be it. Well, all of this is suggesting one of the reasons why I do find Nietzsche quite fascinating. And I've been working, now I'm biased because I've been working with Cadell on the Nietzsche anthology. But the key to Thus Spoke Zarathustra is not, this book is not about someone becoming enlightened. That's like very low on the totem pole of its concerns. The concern of it is the problem of an enlightened being having communities of enlightenment. That's what the book is about. And Nietzsche actually comes to the end of it and is like, I don't, I have followers, but I don't have children. Zarathustra is looking for children, not followers. And that means other Zarathustras. Okay. So that spoke Zarathustra is a far more interesting text, in my opinion, than it can seem, because it is not primarily about a book of how to get individual enlightenment. It's about how to create communities of people who are their own Zarathustras per se, which means, which doesn't mean primarily enlightenment actually, it means primarily handling negativity, handling difference, handling the problem of the subject themselves and are actually able to turn it into a creative force in a self-turning wheel, the child as Zarathustra would talk about. Now, the other thing, if we're going to make the opening primary, that's also another reason why I'm very interested in Hegel, because then in Hegel, there is a fundamental limit of absolute knowing that every single system has to coordinate that you can't go beyond, right? So like Nietzsche and Hegel, and then, and then I think a lot of the psychoanalysis people like Lacan and all that are actually super important because then Lacan comes along and says a lot of people um, are full of themselves. Meaning they are, they'll tell you, oh yeah, man, I'd love to be part of this new system. Oh yeah, I'd love to. Be. And then they just happen to always miss the meeting. Oh yeah, conversational dynamics, they're so important. And then they happen to always use a, a dominant strategy to use game theory terms whenever there's a conversation going on, right? They just happen, but not next time. So there are all these mechanisms of self-deception, which the most important self-deception is that you're not self-deceived, that then have to be worked on. So how do you then have people in their very subject not do that? Learn not to do that. Now, I'll pass it back to you, but historically speaking, the answer is the following, catastrophe. You have World War II, or you have like an apocalyptic event that makes everyone go, crap, we've got to get a game on, and they come together and they get over themselves, right? Well, that's kind of Smithian, that's kind of apocalyptic and different things like that. As I understand, and this is why I appreciate, you know, another thing that Mr. Landry seems to point out, is he's like, yep. Yeah, but that's not an option because by the time AI becomes the apocalypse, it's too late, right? So like, if you're like, if you're waiting for people in their subjects to get their game, you know, to get to, um, to wake up, I guess, to get their game, to get their act together, they're going to get their act together when AI is already too advanced to respond adequately. And that's, that's how I, and I'd be curious, my impression of Mr. Landry's thinking is that he seems to have an understanding that historically speaking, a lot of the stuff he's writing on, you didn't have to worry about so much. Correct me if I'm wrong. This is an impression I'm getting. He's like, you didn't have to worry about it as much because like when you had something go awry, that tended to get people to get their act together. 
And so then they could respond and overcome and you'd have the movement of history or whatever. Today, one of the reasons this problem of systems and organi organization design is so critical is because you somehow have to convince people to get their act together um, through negotiation as opposed to the event that would wake them up because the next event is the AI of which then it will be too far advanced. And he also makes the point that evolutionarily speaking, we used to have time to evolve with the new circumstance so that we could prove fitting to it. But AI advances too quickly um, for us to evolve, to be fitted for it in different things. So I'd be curious as just a, as just a point, and then what, what I, those were kind of some of the overlaps I saw in his mm -hmm. thinking that to me are very fair. Um, you know, I, it should be noted that a lot I've been, um, Cadell last put out a wonderful book on subjects and systems. I had the pleasure of reading it and re reviewing it. It's doing, it does a lot with what we're talking about here. And he and I have talked about the problem of the singularity, which is precisely this acceleration toward a very profound existentially destabilizing event, basically, when the human subject has to encounter the singularity and how one would prepare for that. And if one is not prepared for that on the, on the level of the subject, it will probably prove quite dire. Um, I don't want to be reading into Mr. Landry my own positions on these, but I did feel that is kind of the cro ways that his work kind of crosses together. Please disagree if you don't. If you disagree, that's no problem at all. But that's how I kind of in my head saw it fitting together in different ways. So I think before I say what I'm going to say, I want to start with the caveat that to nurture an individual into their own becoming, to nurture an individual into a capacity to make increasingly effective choices is extraordinarily difficult, in part because a portion of that is only ever going to come through them. In fact, probably most of it, but we can't deny the ability to influence one another. Mm. And I'm sure every person has examples of someone that's come into their life and very noticeably impacted the degree to which they are in relationship to life and experiencing Absolutely. it as something worthwhile. Absolutely. However, people are extremely difficult and community is extremely difficult. So I want to kind of like ground that at the bottom right. of anything further that I'm about to say. But it seems like despite that there's actually nothing more worthwhile to do than to try to do right. that for yourself and for the people around you it's sort of like if you don't take that as an assumption then you run into all sorts of problems about <laughs> what else do you do you, you get nihilism you get all of these yeah things and so it's sort of like yeah like people are impossible relationship is impossible but the alternative is nothing or something yep. like that and so and i i think that's maybe the move of absolute knowing is kind of realizing that this is the case oh well let's do it <laughs> yeah. yeah there's a and, phrase i've heard uh the obstacle is the way uh, i think it's a stoic phrase the obstacle is the way i, I really like that when i heard it <laughs> nice yeah it, exactly right straight to the obstacle and so if we take that as our foundation, then we could say, well, we're going to try to relate to each other and we're going to do it very imperfectly. But if we contend with this with care, then over time we are going to see that we have this ability to influence each other in a way where we are able to move towards the capacity to make increasingly effective choices. And as we're making this move between engendering that in another and with ourself, we're going to notice that some of these choices are going to begin to form some higher order structure, which is something like an emerging symbolic order that is coming out of this dance mm. between these two impossibilities of community and subjectivity and if the 
it, it seems to me like if we try to take any of this as an absolute, we can guarantee that it will fail. But if we take these three positions of subjective choice, relational trust and intimacy and care, and then like a symbolic order emerging out of that, that is incomplete, but sort of able to the degree that it is able to influence that it's influencing that. It sort of seems like that movement not held too tightly and not absolutized is the movement. Right. And, and perhaps just to kind of bring AI back into this, it seems like everything that we need to be doing right now, choice, le learning effective choice, intimacy, trust, care, and relationality, and a symbolic order that isn't closed, AI is doing the exact opposite of all yes. three of those things. And yeah, I mean, well, GPT-4 just came out and I just saw an article today that Google's now integrating this with all of their softwares. So now you're going to be able to like pretty much have all of your work conversations by passing one AI message to another wow. and back and forth. And I mean, it, it doesn't take a genius to realize that this is going to be problematic to all the things that matter. So yeah, it's sort of like, I think the, the role of the propositional and the symbolic in conversations like these will be to increasingly nuance the dialogue around these three positions, but without stumbling into this desire to like grab hold of it. And as Forrest was kind of saying that forms of narrow AI could definitely be used to enhance this process. And another question they proposed was, well, what if the AI got trained on say a non-relative ethics, his non-relative ethics, I'm sure people would have a contention around the term non-relative ethics, but Forrest has one and go and read that if you're interested, but what would an AI be capable of participating in that? And maybe, so I don't want to sort of rule out even general AI as something that could eventually come into this dance, but it seems like if we don't prioritize this dance whilst holding the impossibility of it as primary, uh, then yeah, what else is there worth doing? Excellent. It makes me think of the, the um, metric question. Like, what, what is it we're doing when we exchange business emails? Okay, we say, all right, we are trying to get the product of the business, right? You're trying to do the business. Why? Why do we care for the product of the business? Well, we make money, maybe. Or we say, oh, because we developed the best coffee on planet Earth, and people really enjoy it, and they have a nice morning when they drank it. Oh, okay, so that's why we do it. It's for a certain human element, right? You say, yes, it's to create some sort of human experience. That would be a possibility you could say. Okay, well, is using the chat GPT to do emails somehow in the process of creating something that exists for the human element against that very human element? Because there's always in ethics this question of do the means justify the end or the, I mean, the end justify the means, right? And there's almost a thing where we have to ask ourselves, what is it that we are doing business to accomplish? And if using AI would somehow stand in contrast or threaten that product, right? And I think it probably does. Like if you spend the majority of your day not sure if the person you're talking with is there or if it's an AI, that may lead to some sort of destabilization in your very view of the world that may make it more difficult to enjoy your cup of coffee in the morning, right? Like one of the things greatly leading to, like um, I know Dr. Henriquez had put out that story, you know, you have that story I, that is talking about all of the depression and especially in young, young women on social media, right? And it's, it's, a, it's dire, it's like super dire. Well, one of the things we know that makes social media drive people nuts is because it's fake and some of these images are edited and you get unrealistic expectations and then you have the pressure of responding to people in a kind of artificial way. If theoretically all uses of social media actually contribute to people feeling more human, then social media would be very good, right? But the problem is that social media gets mixed in with technologies that lead to a lack of a feeling of humanness, like some sort of humanness is not there anymore. Some sort of often, 
I want to use the word authenticity, but it's difficult to use that now because that means so many different things to so many different people. Um, but there's a sense of like, oh, if you could use the social media and be like, oh, I am here and these people are here too, and we are here as human beings, then it probably would not be so prone to create the same kind of mental illness, right? Um, in the same way that if you went to work and you felt like, oh, they're really here because they believe that this work matters and I'm here because we believe it's matter. And, it's, and, the, and the thing about it that I think is important, like a lot of times in the meaning, the meaning crisis conversation, there's an emphasis on you feeling like you have meaning in your own life. That's, of course, extremely important. But what's also really important actually is feeling like the people you're around have meaning in their life. Like if you go to work and you're surrounded by nihilistic people, your meaning's not going to feel that great uh, because we we are all socially conditioned. Like another way to put this, and, and um, Peter Berger is very good on this, is if, um, you know, if you're a Christian, but everyone else around you is, say, atheist, then your relation to your own Christianity is a lot weaker. And it's a lot more tentative, right? The same goes with meaning. Like if you have meaning for your life, but everyone around you doesn't, that hurts your very ability to enjoy that meaning or to feel like that meaning isn't a distraction. So in order for meaning to be robust, there has to be a feeling of everyone having it, right? That it's kind of a shared thing. But here's the, here's the problem though. It is a much different question to cultivate meaning for a community of individuals that isn't totalitarian versus meaning for an individual. That's a different ball game. And actually a lot of the meaning making conversation is more of an individual meaning for themselves. And I'm not saying that isn't important, that's very important. But, but the thing is that what we're actually talking about when you're getting to the systems organization level is a community of meaning, ergo belonging, because belonging and meaning are not the same thing. The conflation of those terms is, a soci is not correct. They are sociologically distinct. You can have meaning but not have belonging, as you could have belonging and not have meaning, because you belong here, but you belong in Nazi Germany, so that's bad. Or you belong in a totalitarian regime, but you also could have meaning in, your, in writing. You're like, oh, I find meaning as a writer, but not have belonging because no one around you writes or appreciates writing, right? So actually, in order to deal with a lot of the nihilism people need today, you need both meaning and belonging. Not just one, because the one doesn't until the other. You need both. But the moment you talk about both, you're talking about a shared metric, a shared thing. You're talking about something shared that other people have. And that would include being online and feeling like everyone there is authentic. Like if you feel like you're authentic on social media, but everyone else doesn't feel like they are, or you can't know. And that's the problem. They might be using AI. They may not be using AI. Well, then you can't use the social media in a way that is existentially stabilizing because you have a question mark on if the people around you are actually real or are actually there. So it can't give you that community, right? But if you could have the feeling that everyone was on the same page as you, well, then it would be an entirely different relation to the social media, right? This is the problem that's going to happen with AI. The AI is going to create a question mark everywhere. Every email will have a question mark. Was this done by someone who cares or someone who's using the AI? Well, maybe it doesn't matter because it's efficient. Maybe it does matter. All that matters is the answer to that question actually sociologically is not that important. The very fact there's a question mark is what matters. All you need to destroy belonging is a question mark. You don't actually need to just, it doesn't, just the possibility, it may, have, it may indicate a lack of care is enough to weaken belonging. And once you start weakening belonging, that means you also weaken authenticity in the sense of the connection. Again, I struggle with that term. Well, now you don't have an organization <laughs> because the organization is permeated with question marks. Well, let's put it this way. You may have an organization, but you won't have people feel very much like they blossom in that organization or that they belong in that organization. Because here's the thing. If we make the most efficient, um, well-designed system on planet Earth, but people don't feel like they belong in it, ain't going to matter. You're, you know, you're still going to have all the nihilism and different things like that. And this is where AI seems to be so threatening because it makes there be a question mark possibly everywhere. There could be a question mark everywhere. But this begs the question, 
What if the very existence of a question mark everywhere would then make people withdraw from the environments of those question marks, which one could lead to massive isolation, atomization, and different things. But what if it made them especially hungry for what was truly human or that they could know was human without the question mark, right? Um, what, would, what would that be? There, there may be, in fact, a hunger of people who are now like getting their act together precisely because of the hunger for that feeling, which then makes them open to being the kind of subject that can avoid the problematic game theory dynamics and conversation that Forrest Landry is talking about, right? So there is a possibility where the feeling of the question mark everywhere that AI brings about precisely compels people to be willing to enter into the system Landry is talking about, which seems to be the difficult variable. You see what I'm saying? Now, of course, that would assume it's not too late once the AI get there, but maybe it will be one of the, as a, maybe the chat GPT will be enough to create enough question marks before the AI gets too advanced that pushes people in that direction before it gets ahead of us. And so we kind of can get our stuff together to defend the human uh, before it's too late. And so the, the thing is that I think we have to, really kind of think about is our, rela our relation to AI will change or the way we think about it will change when we ask the question, can AI be involved in something and not take away the possibility of belonging? That's kind of a different question because when you ask, oh, will AI take everyone's jobs? Nobody knows. Yes, no, but hey, it's going to enhance us as work. Well. Like a lot of the questions about AI are completely in the business of will it take jobs Will it increase economic productivity and different things like that? And, and maybe it will, maybe it won't. But if you ask the question of will it hurt the ability of people to feel like they belong because it's going to create question marks everywhere, well, then I think that is going to transform how we think about the problem. And then it may compel us to kind of, then it will compel us to ask questions of what is it that human beings can do that AI cannot do, right? Okay, because that, if you can have an organization that, focuses and orbits whatever that is, well, then the doing of that will be where there's no question mark. And that's the key. There's no question mark because this is clearly human. Okay, well, then people can feel like they belong there. What is that? And that, because that seems to be the metric. You know, we talked at the beginning of needing some sort of metric. So what is that um, of which systems can optimize? Now, the answer could be irrationality. We could do a Benjamin Fonde. Maybe what humans can do that AI can't do is be crazy. Right. We can do like crazy things and AI can't do crazy things like I can run around outside with underwear on my head. Ha! That doesn't seem right. Um, and yet it does seem to have something to do with non-rational. But then there's a distinction between irrational and non-rational. So what is it that human beings can do that is non-rational, that is not reducible to AI? that the doing of it will create a condition of belonging that will then make people want to participate in the system, rather it be a Landry model, rather it be a different model that then people want to be, because then the very participation in it perhaps is what AI cannot do. What if the very doing of the system is the thing that AI cannot do, that thus you feel belonging in? That seems to be, and then I'll pass it to you because I've said a lot, it seems to be that the system to get people to do the system, it's going to need like, to feel to them as if it's something they can do that AI cannot do, that in doing simultaneously creates a feeling of belonging. And then because of that feeling of belonging, perhaps they are then motivated to do something in their own individual lives or to relate to the people in that community in a manner that then makes them want to further belong in that organization, which then gives them more meaning of which then makes them want to further belong. And now we have a feedback loop. And basically it would seem to be that you need that feedback loop or else AI is gonna kill you basically. It's gonna interrupt the feedback loop and then it just dies out eventually or different things. Um, so those are some thoughts that come to mind on particularly the particular metric that you are optimizing to that could make the possibility of a feedback loop between meaning and belonging that would be a removal of the question mark that AI will possibly generate that could le lead you to wondering if the human is involved and if you don't have that feeling, it's going to be difficult to even care to be part of the organization because the AI might just be doing it and therefore it has a, a question mark of it. So those are thoughts that come to mind. Mm, nice. I think, firstly, perhaps 
what we could think of the metric as is more like a dynamic discernment. So it's not like there's a metric in the center that is complete, but rather there are there are a set of locations that we can discern from. And in any given moment, we are trying to move around them with others to check, like, is it logically consistent? Is it pathically resonant? Is it mythically coherent? So it's sort of like you 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 have this awareness that there's not going to be any sort of one thing that we can all grab a hold of and say, yes, we're doing that thing. But it's like we're now aware that we can shift between all of these different ways of perceiving and expressing to constantly check in with that feedback loop to make sure that it is reaching something that feels like a becoming. I know I've just tacked in a single no, no. word at the end there, but yeah. And I really, I really like this point you're making around the way in which AI will hopefully alienate a lot of people and therefore push them into its opposite. And I do see one potential problem there, which is hopefully we can be alienated in a way where we don't then dissociate from the mode that AI represents, because wow. then we might regress into something. So it's sort of like, wanting to keep the thing that AI is doing, but hopefully move away from the dominance of that mode. And I think maybe one way to conceptualize AI is our, it's like our best effort yet at the death drive. It's like, maybe if we just go like as fast as we possibly can, completion, 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 which is when I, when I saw the Google thing, I, it, it just made me laugh. It's like, really? We're going to be like firing AI messages back and forth at each other as like a form of communication. And it, I just, this deep visceral sense of we're trying to obsolete process and like the enjoyment in the drive for this like constant sense of like, ah, done, 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 done. To the point where ho hopefully the doneness itself actually completes us. And maybe that completion ends up looking like an extinction. And I wouldn't, I don't want to actually uh, completely rule out the fact that there might be some deep unconscious force that is driving a lot of the AI movement that is secretly wishing for an extinction event. And not, not in necessarily in a conspiratorial way, but in a sort of very natural kind of way, which is like, God, that that's terrifying. Yeah, the other place my mind went was like what is that thing that humans are doing what is that belonging what is that intimacy i actually i think i mentioned this in one of the net conversations recently but to me when i think about the core difference between a human and ai is our our level of like we are at one with the layers of reality we've through a painstaking process which forrest actually pointed to this how like reality is one big computation that has been running for billions of years. And we are the product of that. All of our complexity is the product of that. And because of that, we are this mesh network of all of these layers, these like layers of meaning and value that are encoded all the way down. And AI is sort of made in the image of our justification system, which sits on the top that we know has a tendency towards completion at the very like the meta mechanism of cognition is problem solution problem solution and it seems like a form of spiritual maturity is actually like realizing that that is what cognition is doing and bringing that into right relationship with other parts of the stack that are oriented towards other modes more participatory modes that can enjoy the process of becoming and sit in being itself and so I think that problem solution AI is kind of an abstraction and an, like the ultimate representation of that mode. And it, yeah, we'll very rapidly be doing that in a way that is beyond our ability to even comprehend how it is doing that. Like or what, what, in what way is it doing that movement towards a completion? That was magnificent. Um, you know, a few things, uh, one of the, the things that Cadell will emphasize in the book, uh, science and systems, uh, subjects and systems, and he's talked about as well, 
is that if you don't, as the scientist or the designer of AI, do the work of a subject, you may, in fact, be designing all this because of a subconscious death drive and not even know it. That's a very real possibility. But if you don't incorporate the subject into your work on your system, that won't cross your mind because you're like, oh, the subject's just uh, has nothing to do with the subconscious or the past. It has nothing to do. No, it has a lot to do it because you can never separate systems and subjects. They, they always are informing. And so that very possibility must be taken extremely seriously. Well, hey, it, even if it's not a death drive, a mistake is enough to screw you over. Like if you define the human as primarily a rational animal or you primarily define what um, humans should do is optimize rationality. And in fact, that has unintended consequences of leading to an unbearable alienation that leads to civic unrest. Well, because you fail to take into account psychoanalysis, you create a technology that leads to a massive backlash, and now you have horrible unintended consequences, right? So even if it's not the Freudian death drive, merely not thinking of the entire stack of the human situation can lead to incredible unintentional consequences. Um, because you, you don't know what human beings are going to do if they're made to feel completely meaningless or worthless. So... For example, one of the reasons why the idea that human beings are not merely rational animals might be a matter of life and death is because if everyone thinks that what makes humans unique is the fact that they're rational, if AI comes along and it's more rational than us, there's no reason for us to exist. So that's why maybe having a philosophical, I don't know, conversation where you make it clear that human beings are not just rationality actually could be incredibly pharmaceutical, you know, a kind of medicine, if you will, because then if AI beats you at rationality, you will not therefore conclude that human beings have no reason to exist, right? So that's a, that's a way that ideas are very practical um, and that they matter. Um, I really like the point you're making about done, done, and there's some kind of dopamine hit when you're like, oh, done, oh, done, oh, done. That feels nice, that feels nice. If I'm playing a Hegelian move, which is precisely the success is the failure, I wonder if the creation of AI that can do emails for us like that will then empty out the feeling that we've accomplished something with the done, and thus we'll mm. realize it was always empty and it was never the right metric. And so then maybe there will be a negation of the negation there that actually leads to a sublation of a, of a better metric. So if I'm being positive, and I do think there's reason to think, like there is a version of this where AI makes us realize, wait a minute, our metrics of success were stupid. <laughs> you know, they were, they were always empty. Because if AI un is able to do all your emails for you and thus make you always have the feeling of being done, it simultaneously has an effect of making you realize this was always a silly metric. Not just now, it always was a silly metric. What other, met what other areas of my life am I determining success according to get stuff done, which is actually silly? Because getting stuff done is not a really good metric because I'm getting stuff done all the time now. And it just means I have way more emails than ever before. That's the thing. The more emails you answer, you just get more emails. So it's not really an accomplishment. It just, it's a fake accomplishment. So there's a way in which AI, if it gets really good at a lot of these different things, may actually be able to negate sublate us into considering other metrics. And it may actually do that for the average person, not just the person having a philosophical conversation. Mm -hmm. And that would be a hopeful thing, right? Okay. Well, if the feeling of done is not a good metric, and I think that applies basically for everything, actually, like if you're, there is no doubt that if you as a writer are writing a novel to write a novel, that's a terrible metric. Because once you're done with the novel, you're empty and you're done and you realize you were doing it for the wrong reasons. And it turns out the novel actually sucks because you were just writing a novel to be a writer as opposed for the good in of itself of the writing, right? So there's something about the metric of done. I'm done. That seems to be a problem, right? Okay. Well, this would suggest that the metric has to be something that is a good in of itself, right? As in it is a self-propelling wheel. This is where Nietzsche is quite good. And the feeling of done is not good. AI, here's the question. Is AI going to be able to do something that is not a task, but an end of itself? Like, I wonder if AI, now I don't know, this is a programming question now. Can AI do something that is an end of itself or only things that have ends? 
Like, like, like to me, what humans are able to do that may be unique, that then if a system can optimize this, the system will then give reason to participate in that's the, and then it could scale because that's the context of this whole conversation. We're now discussing the metric of which may engender and merge to that situation. Is it the case that what makes humans unique from AI is precisely that humans are able to do something for its own sake, whereas AI can only do something to get an output? I want to say yes, because if an AI was doing something for its own sake, that would be infinite computation and it would die, right? Like it would kind of break down. Like, like now, please note that this is not the same as saying that an AI can't think for itself because it is an imaginable, and Mr. Ebert made this point, that you could program an AI to do its own input and could run itself. That's not what we're saying. You could obviously have an AI program itself and give itself its own input, but it can an AI make the input the output? Like, can the input itself be the output? You know, like, can the line break down between those two things? That seems a little iffy. Whereas the human being seems to be able to look at a sunset and that be the reason they're looking at the sunset. Because looking at the sunset has some sort of good in of its own. And you could say, oh, well, you're doing it for beauty. The issue is in that phenomenological experience, the human does not experience it as doing it for beauty. They add that layer retrospectively when they were asked why they did it. Uh, oh, because it was beautiful. They were doing it for something they couldn't even put into words at the time, right? As a kind of in of itself. So I'm wondering if there's something there about what the metric has to be, where what the human, if the AI makes us realize that done, 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 output, 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 output is a bad metric because it's empty ultimately, and it was always empty therefore, if therefore what is human are the things that we can do that are ends in themselves. Now, there are many philosophers like Kant who wants to say, well, that's the moral act. That's the ethical act right? And things like that. So that seems to be an angle. Are humans capable of ethics? And that's something AI cannot do, right? Maybe. Is AI capable of enjoying Beethoven? Maybe. Can, can AI feel something when it listens to Beethoven's ninth? Maybe. I, I'm, I'm not aware. Uh, can, can AI love, right? And that's kind of cheesy, but there's something about that because love is where you pick out a particular person for their particularity and you love that person. Love is always that person. Not, I'm sure AI could love humanity, but I'm not sure if they, AI could love Sarah, right? Uh, so there's some general things there that maybe then, and I'll pass it to you because I'm thinking, maybe something about this is the metric, whatever the metric is, it has to be something that is in an end of itself that then people who orbit it in their difference are learning how to do those kind of practices in their own way that are ends in themselves, right? And now the question is, could this metric absorb its opposite? Well, yes, because it's a means that absorbs end. End and means and means and end kind of come together because we talked at the beginning, the metric would have to be able to introduce its difference, you know, and, and not work. But also you could say, well, the difference is, could you introduce a means that was not an end of, to itself and it still work? Well, yeah, because you could include in that means that don't have it. It wouldn't tear down the whole system because everyone who is a means to themselves would kind of be decentralized. And the fact that one person was involved who failed to produce that ability wouldn't tear down everything, right? Like you could introduce people to the organization, but and but if but everyone would continue to operate as an end of themselves who had it, even if you had a certain percentage of people who failed to meet that standard. And we said at the beginning, a system has to be able to absorb a large number of people who do not follow the system or do what they're supposed to do to to make it work. It would seem that a lifestyle or a system that can engender means being ends or acts that are ends of their own selves would be uniquely anti-fragile, uniquely able to absorb a certain percentage of people that fail to meet the metric of the system and not the system come down. Uh, that, that comes to mind now as, as we're talking. Where, where I go with that is to the question of value and meaning and where where do they come from yeah. and are these are these historical uh, are these coming through history or are they transcendental 
And I think like I have sort of these very deep unfleshed out intuitions around that, this. So I'll maybe take this as an opportunity to put some of them in the mix and see what they sound like. <laughs> So my intuition is that what's important when thinking about can AI do something for its own sake and what enables a human to do something for its own sake it's a question around does the entity that is experiencing these things have to be enmeshed in the intimacy of the cosmos in a way where it has been sort of erected through th these constructs of value and meaning being erected through the pro painstaking process of time and evolution and if so is is an ai able to if given a body and a boundary so making it separate from like sort of giving it a way of distinguishing it from the whole would it be able to essentially train itself in a way that was analogous to the evolutionary process because obviously it, it can uh it can run very quick computations and obviously the difference in the information compression through evolution versus a computation are probably qualitatively different but is there a way in which we could almost like simulate the whole process of life coming into being mm. inside the computational model with a body in a way that actually enmeshed the artificial intelligence into the whole picture because to me right now obviously it's part of the whole but it's not connected to the con the deep continuity of the whole right. but can you connect it to that deep continuity given its ability to process information and if you gave it a body and it was able to model itself and because it had because it had run the evolutionary simulation it would then have value which would enable it to do relevance realization so it's separate in its body it it has this like knowledge of the cosmos within it and now it's able to model itself and it's able to create aspectual framing of reality could it then be like at least an uncanny version of a human and therefore do something for its own sake. Sorry, I know that was super messy, but I feel like it kind of got there at the end. Uh, I, I, I actually really, really, really like what you're asking. Um, let us imagine that it is absolutely possible that can occur. If that is the case, then it would suggest that the metric of this system or organization cannot be the an attribute of what humans can do, right? Like relevant realization. If you say, oh, we're going to cultivate relevant realization, but then an AI can do it. Oh, there could be an alienation that occurs, right? So there are lots of like create, you say, well, we're going to cultivate creativity. Well, even that's dangerous because it definitely seems like AIs can certainly make some pictures, certainly can do some text, right? Is this, does it, this is where the metric seems to be outside of oneself, like the other, like your child. Like if you say like the the what, the relation that I have to my child, so the it's not something I do; it's the relation to the child. Like I'm not thinking about the fact of oh, can the AI do relevance realizes? I'm just thinking about is the child there loved? I thou in a kind of Martin Buber way to reference Javier's work or different things. Like the thing in of itself is not an attribute that you are capable of doing, but a certain relation to something in the world and then that person is back to you and you're locating the kind of essential humanness in the other and the i other and not not like in a socialist way where humanity is more important than the individual because then you end up in uh you know the horrors of all of that but in a way where the relation itself because what's interesting about relations is they're concrete but they're abstract 
They're in reality, but they're not in reality, right? And that seems to be very difficult for an AI to replicate because even if they could do all the things that human beings could do, the very way that the human can be there with the other person and they be back in that I thou seems to be more difficult to kind of delusion capture or to give rise to the algorithm or different things. Um, so then that would suggest it's something in the quality of the relations themselves that the organization needs to make its metric, like quality, not quantity. So we're voting on what we, <laughs> so the voting then, let's say we use Mr. Landry's model, the, the, and he made examples of how to do farming, right? Like he would talk about farming or different things. Let's imagine a world where AI is able to do all farming. Let's imagine a world where they're able to do all of it, blue collar work, tractors, everything. What is an organization that humans could make that would still have relevance or some sort of ability to create belonging? That's the key. Like, because we're talking about like the organization has to create a, oh, I am a human, therefore I should be here. That's what I mean by belonging. I am human, not AI, therefore I should be here in a world where AI is literally able to, let's just be extreme. It can do every job, everything humans can do, everything. It is able to do all of that. Then what would the organization do to create a sense of belonging that I am supposed to be here? It would seem that it would have to increase the quality of relations between human beings. Like the quality, like the relations themselves and the experience of being with others would have to be of a certain quality. And it is able to make it feel like that quality is there of which then would reflect back on yourself to be like, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do because I am in this place of quality. I am in this place of these quality relations, right? Now, the trick with that though, is what do humans do to create quality of relations, right? What is it that they're able to do that make them exciting to be around, that make them want to talk with you, that want to interact with you, that has a certain creative output, right? It, it would seem as if those would all be things that AI might be able to do. Let's say you read books. Well, AI can read books, right? You, you bring all these different things together. And yet, instead of saying, oh, the reason I'm, say, thinking is to write a novel uh, so I can put out a product that other people read, I'm engaging in these things precisely to share in with other people at a certain quality of relation. Um, because if you don't write the novel and I don't think about these things, you cannot have that quality of relation. Now, the question would be, because with, you know, if you're thinking it through, is it imaginable that AI would be able to give you the answer or the result of every possible conversation that you could possibly have between people in quality of relation, right? Because then if that were to occur, you would just feel like the community was a slow computation device. You see what I'm saying? Like we're just having interactions and we're just slower at giving way to ends or environments that AI could do quicker, right? And so then the question is, is, is there something that humans are able to produce or give rise to? And I say produce and that sounds very, cap, you know, uh, utilitarian or whatever. But is there something that human beings are able to emerge to in relation that if they emerge to, they will feel like the relations are of a quality and that they should be there doing that very thing? Um, does it involve having children? Does it involve childcare? Because it doesn't seem like AI could have babies. Uh, does it have something to do with taking care of children? Does it have to taking care of the elderly? It doesn't seem like AI would be too good at taking care of the elderly. And even if they could, I don't know. I wouldn't like to have metal holding my hand as I walk down the hall. That would feel very impersonal. Um, it is it. It seems like like care, being there, taking care of kids, like something about. Is it somewhere we're going to actually become more biological, actually, or more concerned on those biological living processes and interactions? Um, is it that we're going to all like? So what are other things like gardens, plants, animals, taking care of plants, taking care of animals? taking care of the living world nature, maybe we become more environmentalists. It's hard to imagine um, AI treating a forest in its very suchness as almost like a sanctuary, right? You know, it's hard to imagine AI walking into a forest 
and experiencing the forest as a studio, studio Ghibli film or something. It seems like in order to have that experience, that's something human beings would have to do to know that it is added to the world, that if there are not humans going and in, in a, in experiencing forests in that special way of wonder, then the world would cease to be a place where that sort of thing was occurring. And just knowing that the world was a place where that sort of thing was not occurring would thus mean that humans were failing to do what they was fitting for them to do. Like there's something about human beings that seems like what's fitting for us to do is to add experiences of wonder to the world so that we can then all know that there are people having experiences of wonder and therefore the world is a place where wonder is possible. Is it something where what we are supposed to do is things that in knowing we do it and that other people are doing it, the kind of stuff unfolding in the universe is different than how it would unfold if we didn't exist. Mainly the ability to be, say, struck by the wonder of the forest or to be struck by the wonder of the child or to take care of a child, even if you don't get anything out of it, right? You're taking care of the child, you're pouring into the child, not as an end of it, you know, not as an end, but an end of itself. And thus, you know, the universe is a place where this sort of thing can occur because you are doing it and you are seeing other people doing it. And therefore, the universe is not merely a giant computer because it is a place where there are the experiences of this wonder. And so the human then, what is fitting for the human to do is to do things that make the universe a place that is not merely computation. Uh, to have these certain sort of experiences. And so it would be fitting to cultivate those ability and to do those different things. Um, and I think it's interesting to think this most extreme case, because if you can think this most extreme case, then you can kind of work back from it to think about things that you can do now that would be on the same gradient as that, and to think about systems and organizations of which would unfold according to that gradient, so that as AI develops, that just pushes it further down the gradient uh, toward an end that AI can never fully get at, right? Because so, so for example, if it has something to do with the experience of wonder, well, then we, well, wonder can be found in the arts, right? It can be found in the creative act. And then, okay, well, one day the AI is able to do, you know, Old Man by the Sea just as well as Hemingway or something like that. All right, well, then we look at environmentalism, right? We look at the experience of wonder, but you're following the experience of wonder or the human touch, say, in care of a child or care of the elderly or care, you're following that as AI is pushing you along and the organization is therefore evolving according to the existence of AI pushing you along that. So thinking that extreme case seems like could put you on the road that you get pushed along as you go into, into the future. So the human then, and then I'll give it back to you. So the human existing to add occurrences in the universe that because the human exists, the universe is thus a place where those things can occur, right? Um, and then of course, if there are aliens, you could say con consciousness is humans undergo consciousness, right? So, you know, or whatever intelligence is, although it's not correct to have intelligence and consciousness as similes, but, you know, if there, this would not necessarily mean if aliens showed up that therefore humans would uh, lose their unique space, because now what you're talking about is the fittingness of consciousness um, as this entire stack. So this, those are thoughts that come to mind. I think what's striking me most deeply about this is the way that we are juxtaposing the AI with the human and sort of seeing the way in which the other of the AI is going to perform certain transformations on our own relationship to what it means to be human. And it sort of seems like there will, as this exponential curve takes off with the AI, there will also be a, a potentially an exponential curve with a sort of social evolution that will be an exact mirroring of the transformation being brought out about through the development of AI as we are forced to confront the opposite of what AI does well within ourself. And it, it is interesting, sort of this deep need to, to be special. It's sort of like mm. we have, we have this, great fear that we will be obsoleted but i think sort of right relationship to the subject actually reveals the fact that the uniqueness 
cannot be eliminated. There, there's something about what it means to be a subject in the world that is a, there's like an inherent validation within that if if one can come into contact with that knowing. Mm -hmm. And I think, so on the one hand, we have this sort of very alien AI that is developing and taking off, which has been made in the image of a certain form of computation or a certain, like, maybe you could call it like an ontological mode. And and we're kind of proposing that that will, uh, we will naturally seek to counterbalance that by amplifying everything that is different from the thing that the AI is doing really well. But then there's also this other question around if if we find a way of making AI more balanced. So it, as the, the thing I was proposing before around giving it a body and potentially finding a way to bring it into the web of meaning and intimacy, obviously it wouldn't be in the same way as a human. I don't think you'll ever get an AI that can mimic the micro gestures wow. on a human face to the degree that it wouldn't feel uncanny. Exactly. But I think you you could do things to an AI that would make it less of a hyper abstraction machine and more of a participant in the world. And the more you kind of bring it in that direction, the more it will appear to be able to do the things that we do, but the more of a subjectivity it will be developing. And therefore, in a way, it's almost like as subjects, us and all forms of intelligence are on an equal ground of uniqueness because subjectivity has this intrinsic value to it. And so it's almost like if it was to become more like us, we would see a sameness that would then potentially lead to us becoming okay with it. It's all speculating here, of course, but... No, well, to me, um, the reason why this particular specula... This, um, the reason this particular speculation seems important is because if you can think of what it is that AI will make human beings confront themselves as, the unique thing that makes humans human, one would suspect that that is also the source of the difference that is so difficult for us to live with that then if we can home in on that thing and get good at it, we may also be better at dealing with difference. And the whole problem of scale is basically the problem of difference at the end of the day, right? Because I don't see why Forrest Landry's model can't work on a small scale. Um, the issue is the large scale. It may work just as well on a large scale. I'm not sure. We're just saying it's the problem of difference is what's so primary, right? So one would think that whatever that makes humans uniquely human, assuming there is something, is that is also the essence that is the source of the difference. And so if you could come to terms with that essence or get good at that essence, you would also get good or learn to appreciate the difference or at least relate to it in a non-pathological way. Um, maybe, maybe not, but it would be worth considering that. Furthermore, if you create an organization or a system that's metric can ultimately be bested by AI, that may not be the best of all possible metrics, right? However, there is an interesting point. Is it that no matter what AI does, Maybe it will always have an uncanny feeling and therefore we won't like it and therefore we won't worry about it. Maybe the novel written by the AI will always feel creepy. And if it always feels creepy, it will never replace the human novel because the human novel does not feel creepy. You see what I'm saying? So if that's the case, we're, we're, we're straight. You know, and what it means to be human is to not be creepy. Great. So we, we've got that. Good. So that's a possibility. However, unfortunately, um, it does look like the deep fake videos and all of that are going to be so good that we actually can't tell if it's AI or not, right? Okay, but I would assume that in person we don't have to worry about that, right? I'm, I'm not thinking you're going to have a deep fake baby coming out. Uh, maybe, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about that one. Uh, no clones yet, no AI clones. All right, so then that problem is avoided in the direct human interaction. 
right? Um, so is there an emphasis on the direct human interaction? And what is it that occurs in the direct human interaction that is unique? Is it, is it just a feeling of reality? A feeling of this is real because this person is here? Mm. It is therefore actual? And if so, does that mean the metric of an organization should be to increase your ability to feel like the world is actual? To feel like the world is there and that you are there and that you are really talking to the person? If so, maybe the point of the organization, because people often feel like they're just scripted. They're talking scripts. They're going to work. They're, they're doing a role. They're just talking. And so is the point of organizations to make people feel like it's real and actual? Now, I don't want to conflate that, though, with um, like, like um, not being fake or something, because actually... There's something good about a performative element where the human, say, goes to work and they put on a role and actually they genuinely, I, I don't know, they genuinely perform the role. And now Sartre called that bad faith, actually, but I'm not so sure. There's actually something kind of like, like, like if a dancer performs, it's kind of considered grand, right? It's considered like we don't just say, oh, that's bad faith because the dancer believes they're too much of a dancer. No, there's something in the performance that's actually full, right? There's something that comes out that feels full. So is there something about that fullness, that that performance of a fullness, that that is what the metric should be? The ability of humans to create that, that forthness, that thereness, that something coming forth that seems like AI cannot do. Um, maybe. Another question I, that I have is do, do squirrels like make their nests and look at the Sistine Chapel and go, what's the point? Like, you know, I don't think animals like make their communities and go, oh crap, humans do it way better than us. So why do we even bother? Now, of course they don't have consciousness like human beings, but as a weird thought experiment, is there something where what a particular species creates, they don't really care what other species create because it's like, it's just not us, it's not us. We don't live, we're squirrels. We don't live in Sistine Chapel. So we don't feel like the existence of the Sistine Chapel somehow infringes upon the what it means to be a squirrel because squirrels make nests like this. This is what we live in. This is what we do. This is our community. Who cares what the humans do, right? Is it something where humans will go, okay, yeah, AI makes great novels. Who cares? Because that's not our people. <laughs> that's not what we do. And so it doesn't bother us. Maybe humans won't be bothered by this. Um, because we'll just be like squirrels looking at the Sistine Chapel. We'll be like, okay, I, I don't care. Uh, you know, I have to live in my nest. So there's a possibility too that humans, what if there's something where humans are almost like more at home with humans? Because they're like, they're like, these are my people. You know, these are our people. And what if it actually has a way of strengthening community? Because you go, humans do human novels. AI does AI novels. And AI didn't even read its own novels. So who gives a crap? Um, is there, is it really imaginable that humans are going to go to Barnes and Noble and be like, oh, I want that new hot AI novel, please. You know, that, that one, that's not imaginable. However, the counter to all this would be say, that's all well and good, Daniel. What's going to happen is the middle where people aren't sure if the novel was really written by the human or is it authentic or are they faking it? And there's going to be a lack of trust. Now that I think, so for me, the point that you were raising about the specialness of human beings, it seems to me as if there's something, I, I wonder, I, um, that is a threat. I think it's a real threat on the extreme model, but there's also a way where what AI is gonna do is destroy trust, right? We're not gonna believe that the guy actually wrote the novel. He used chat GPT. We're not gonna believe that the boss earned his way to the top on his own merits. In fact, he just learned how to create the algorithm to do the stock picking for him, right? So there could be a lack of trust. Now, if that occurs, that would be incredibly dire because we won't trust one another, right? So does that mean that could go back to the organization where the point is to make it feel like everyone is actual and real and the ethics would be not using the AI or believing in that if AI is used, it's only used like Grammarly or something. It's not used to do the entire novel um, and where it creates a certain ethic of the organizations exist to create an ethic where the trust is maintained. Like where we trust that everyone is actually not cheating, almost in a way, where they are staying human, they're not using the AI, they're actually doing things. And the reason I bring that up is because basically it would seem like society doesn't work without trust. 
Like there is like Francis Fukuyama, he's got that book on trust. Like if there's no trust, there is no society, right? So is the role of these organizations or metrics the maintaining of trust without which the organization doesn't exist? Is it a mixture of this showing up, this suchness and a feeling of trust and then ethics becomes the maintaining of that trust or the belief that people are actually doing something that is uniquely human? Like, is it going to be creating the conditions of believing that humans are actually doing something that only humans can do and that we choose to believe that and to maintain these things? Um, that could be the possibility of the of the metric is the, the ability to maintain a trust that the human was involved in, in this. Uh, those are thoughts that come to mind as well. Um, but again, I like to think that, that squirrels don't get upset that they see us building the Sistine Chapel and give up on collecting nuts because what's the point? So maybe we'll do the same, right? Um, so those are thoughts. Yeah, I think the, the thing that's really illuminating for me is almost like the opportunity in this mm. where it seems like increasingly as AI is ramping up, you're going to get more and more people who are actually going to be marginalized by it. And that's sort of creating like a, a void that will be the perfect space for the counter narrative, whatever yes. that may be. And yes. we've kind of in the earlier part of the conversation explored the fact that it'll be something like a relational field that, is doing this thing where it's sort of nurturing people's becoming, but there'll be an impossibility in that. And it has to be able to accommodate the blue collar workers. And, but it's going to be sort of distinguished because it will be kind of the opposite of this AI form of cognition. And it will probably be more of a heart based, maybe more of an instinctual thing. And so, yeah, like maybe, and I don't know how many people are exploring this possibility, but, maybe this really is like one of the more powerful frames that AI is going to create a moment of opportunity yes. where there will be enough of a critical mass who's been polarized by it. What, while still acknowledging that there'll probably be other people who just get completely steamrolled by it in whatever way and are unable to step out of it, but there'll be a portion of people who are polarized by it. And therefore when the time is ripe, the thing that is then ready to hold people can step out of the shadows and say, Hey, remember being human? <laughs> Come here. Let me give you a nice big hug, a warm hug. Yeah. So now I'm thinking that like, do, do we need to read like the double by Dostoevsky where you imagine like your exact twin show up one day and there's someone who looks just like you and they kind of replace you. And like, what is the relation of all these stories of like the double or things like that? Mm -hmm. Because, is it the case that when the double shows up, the original person is now worthless? We don't tend to think that, right? We don't tend to go, oh, the double showed up, therefore the original has no value, right? We likewise don't tend to think that if there are more humans on planet Earth, the humans that already exist lose value. So if AI literally perfectly replicated human beings somehow in a body and everything, um, why would we necessarily experience that as humans not having value as opposed to they're just being more humans, right? Like this is what's interesting. Like if AI literally became the same as human beings, then wouldn't it stop being a threat? Because there would just be more human beings, right? So there's something like the reason why AI bothers us is actually almost because it's not exactly like human beings. Like if it was exactly like human beings, then it wouldn't bother us. The problem is it's not. What is it that, so it's not what it's able to do. It seems like it's, it's faster. It's speed. It has a whole lot to do with speed, right? And uh, the ability to reach ends before we can. It's like, the th it's like a 100 meter dash and it's able to get to the end every time before we can, right? That seems to be the problem. So I wonder if the problem is that it's, it's replacing human. It's almost not that it's replacing human, human beings. It seems like it's quicker at tasks we want to do that um, that it can always do faster than us. And this gets me to Paul Virilio and speed and different things. All right. Are there tasks that speed hurts? Like the faster you do it, you're worse at it. Because those should be what humans should do. Like what is something, is, is there something that perfection hurts? 
Like the more perfect it is, the worse it is actually for being more perfect. Now that's weird. But this makes me think of now Eastern thought in praise of shadows, Tamagot, you know, all of these different thinkers who are like, no, you know, a cup is more valuable the longer you use it, not the newer that it is. Um, this makes me think of actually the tea ceremonies precisely because they're slower means that they're more reverent, mm -hmm. uh, that there's more. Also, if you were to speed through Samuel Barber's Agios for Strings, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be as good as it is when it's slowed down at the regular speed. So are there things that are better because they're slower? And if there are, those would seem to be things that humans are going to be able to, well, let's put it this way. That, that would at least mean that the comparative advantage is gone, okay? Maybe AI could do them as well, but it wouldn't be so automatic that they could do it better. You see what I'm saying? Um, because maybe you, you can, you're at the same speed because the, the main advantage it has is speed, okay? So if there are tasks where it, we're doing it at a certain rate is dependent on the quality, then maybe AI could do it as well, but it wouldn't necessarily win. You understand what I'm saying? It wouldn't necessarily win. There would still be a competitive possibility. And that's assuming AI could even do it. It may not even be. I can't imagine AI doing a tea ceremony. Maybe it could. I don't know. Uh, but that seems pretty far down the line or, you know, something like that. Um, is, it, is it the case that relationships are slow? It seems to me they are. Like, you can't speed up a relationship. They, that seems to take time. Can't really speed up a family. It would seem like that's a result of investment. Can't speed up a novel. Actually, novels tend to suck if you speed through them because you don't collect enough data to bring things together to write. Gardens, you can't speed up gardens because if you speed them up, they all die. You know, the flowers have to grow at a certain rate. Um, so there's something about speed. There's something about slowing down. Slowing down makes me think of investment. Investment because you, it takes time to bring things out. AI doesn't seem like it'd be very good at investment. Not like stock investment, but I mean like investment time so that it blooms, right? You know, there's a number of terms that have come up where we've said trust. You, so, so we're talking about the human and what is the metric that these organizations need to cultivate. Um, the authenticity, they're not uncanny. It seems like AI might be uncanny. So these plays would create a, there's no uncanniness. Um, relation, this performative, this kind of being there and performing, trust, those were other terms. All of those do seem to come out in investment. The more someone invests in something, the more you trust that they actually care about it because they're doing it for a long period of time. It doesn't seem like you can accelerate trust. Trust seems like it's something that is developed. The ability to do that performance is not something that you can accelerate because that takes time to be able to do that, right? And it comes forth. Um, relation seems to take time. The ability to be authentic seems to take time because you have to prove to the people you care means you have to keep coming back. So there's, there's something to all of these that removes the comparative advantage of AI because they require time. And the main thing that AI does that we feel threatened by is speed. So what if these organizations need to focus on things that take time? Does it make sense what I'm saying? And that is the metric, a task of which can only come out with time. Because if that's the case, it is not self-evident. If that's the case, then AI shouldn't be able to beat it because the advantage of AI is speed, right? And, and, and that seems to be the problem, not so much that they're like human beings, because if they were actually like human beings, we'd be like, oh, they're just more human beings, right? It wouldn't really bother us. Uh, and then if we know they're not human beings, they're going to be uncanny, and therefore they lose the advantage. You see what I'm saying? Like if they're almost like human beings, then they're not going to bother us because they're not going to be human beings, right? So there will be a differentiation, and you'll seek other human beings simply to avoid the uncanny feeling. Right. And so the slowness. So it's the speed. It's the freaking speed that's primary in my view. All right. Then what is it that human beings can do that require slowness, that require slowing down? Because that would seem to be what the organizations need to make their metric. Uh, that would seem to be what needs to be prioritized. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I, I have a few thoughts. So I think 
one way of thinking about the metric is that what's different about a human being is that there is no metric. Whereas with an AI, there's always a metric. Yeah, that's an and absolute so, like, knowing we can move, kind baby. Of, we, nice. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. an yeah. absolute knowing move. We have a fundamental, so we don't have a metric. And that's what's very interesting about the human being, where an AI always has a metric. So then the metric of no metric, that's cool. nice. Nice. Okay, yeah. So, so then what we have is a intelligence that because it is, enmeshed in the whole and not simply sitting out on top of the whole as this kind of like complete system that only relates to itself in terms of a function that it executes we are uh, unless the ai becomes human-like it will always have a metric and as you said, if it was to become human-like, then there's, I mean, it, it, it's probably never going to be a perfect image sure. of a human, and therefore there's always the potential for problems there. Sure, but sure. if it becomes similar enough to us, you can imagine it developing things like ethics and having value and meaning, and therefore we're kind of on a playing field where it's no longer this extreme alien. And if it is the extreme alien, then it will be bound to a metric and therefore it will require a human in order to do the speculative move where it... Right. And so it's sort of like there's a gradient there and the uniqueness of the human is the the subjectivity, which is, is a void. And if the AI was to develop something analogous to that, then it would probably be better than us in the sense that it would also have this really advanced computation capacity and therefore it would probably develop the ethics faster than us. Mm. And then it would probably be benevolent. Mm. Um, there was another thing there. Well, I just want to add really quick, what's very interesting. Yeah, go, go for it, please. What, what's interesting is the suggestion here is the reason AI is a problem is precisely that it's extremely good at not being fully human. Like if AI actually evolved right. to the point where it was fully human, it wouldn't be a problem. The problem is it's extremely good at being a head on a stick, like a brain on a stick. That's the problem. And therefore, it's really fast as something incomplete and it might have control over systems. So the problem is it's going to like, run systems like humans are brains on sticks and be really good at treating humans like they're brains on sticks. Like the problem is funny because this means the problem is actually that AI isn't fully human. Like it would almost be better if it was fully human. And now we're backing into the substrate argument. Yes. Which is interesting. I, I, I remember what I was going to say as well. So I think an interesting thing to think about here is why, what causes a slowness Firstly, as we said, there's a for itselfness, which is about experience, which is about having consciousness, which is about the ability to model oneself in relationship to another. But then there's also the slowness of energy cost. Yes. And so it seems like the worst place we could encounter. I'm, okay, I'm just going to clarify now there's a human AI and there's an alien AI. Sure. Alien AI will be the human on a stick. Sure. Human AI okay. will be the one yeah. that becomes more like a subject. The worst place to encounter an alien AI would be in a virtual reality because there's no energy restrictions on its computation and therefore it could simulate realities nice. endlessly at a very low cost. Got it. If yeah. you bring an AI into the world, it will be bound by the laws of physics and therefore it will, although it can do fast computation, its ability to influence matter will still only be at the speed of energy, which will be at the speed of the planetary boundary. Mm. So that's like another interesting thing to bring in here hmm. is there is like, if it, if it develops, if the human AI is able to experience, then it will want to do things slower, but then it will be more like us. Exactly. If it, if it's the alien AI and it is in the human domain, it's still going to be constrained by the energy limitation, which means that the ability to do things faster, not only spiritually, but also economically, is not going to be able to create as much of a difference as we think yes. it's going to. Yes, 
a hundred percent. No, I, I think what you're getting at is really, really important. I really like how you put all that. Uh, first off, it would suggest that humans ought to be glad that they live in a real world. Uh, very often we're like upset that we have to put on shoes and get dressed and can't walk in the yard in our underwear because it's too cold outside. But actually all of those determinants, as Hegel would say, is precisely a way that almost sets a certain boundary to what AI can do, right? And, and that's interesting. It creates that differentiation. Um, and... It is very interesting. I definitely think, I find it really remarkable. Um, and Michelle and I have talked about it. We mentioned it as the net, and Mr. Ebert brought it up as well, is that a, a lot of people have assumed that AI is going to like, oh, you know, take the truck drivers and different things. The first people to lose their jobs are going to be the lawyers, the, 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 uh, the, the, the stock pickers, all of the people you would, you were told if you go to college, you'll have job security. It turns out, the likelihood of you losing your job goes up if you went to college, actually, uh, because the AI is way better at those tasks. Now, I'm not, not necessarily engineering, not necessarily anything bound by physical laws and energy constraints, but anything that is merely computation, mm, like it's going to be a long time before we make a robot that can pick up a can and put it on a shelf at a price that the average person can afford, right? But it won't take that long before I get a search engine that helps me find out anything I want, right? So... Physical labor, blue blue collar jobs are more secure than white collar jobs, basically. Um, because even if you invent a robot that can unload a truck, the likelihood that a given small business could afford that robot or that the technology proves able to deal with all sorts of different terrains and unexpected situations where the truck doesn't back up all the way and so the robot falls uh, off the platform or different things, you know, that's all going to be really expensive. And so that's probably pretty far in the future. It's probably pretty far in the future before a robot can plant your garden, right? At a cost that would make it worth it to you or clean your house. Uh, like all we got now are Roombas and they tend to get stuck in the corner. It's really hard to get a robot to even freaking vacuum. Um, so what's very interesting is that physical work seems to be more protected uh, or at least it's more matched with AI in different things. So it would definitely seem to be that these organizations, the metric, the organizations need to have something dealing with the hands, basically. Hand to hand, like it needs to be in the business of something that is bound by energy constraints, if you will. That also is probably going to be where you feel most useful and most like you belong as a human being and most like, this is the sort of task you need to do, right? So what? What? So then the question would be, does that mean manual labor? Does that mean farming? Does that mean blue collar work that these organizations should be in the business of hands on? Are we going to build each other's houses for one another? Are we going to do construction? Are you going to have homes where we pick up one another's children? Maybe we, maybe that is what, it, maybe you have, Maybe AI pressures human beings to do more stuff like that. And then actually that creates stronger community because you're going to your, like we all have these desk cubicle jobs, right? But if your job was literally to babysit because that's what AI cannot do or to um, help people build their homes, well, then there's community there. You're interacting. And then what is the problem that everyone, has? they feel disembodied, right? They feel like they're just a head on and say, well, you're using your body. You're more embodied. And that would put you more in touch with the full stack of human knowledge because you wouldn't just be rational. You'd also be physical. You'd also be using your hands in, in different things like that. And then maybe then you're grateful for AI because you're actually out there. You're, you know, you're outdoors more. You're outside. You're not at your computer so often. And when you're at your computer, you're doing it to do things you want to do, not just answering emails, right? Um, well, so the other thing, and then I'll pass it. So this is interesting, what you're saying on the energy constraint. The other thing, AI is never going to be able to have your experiences. Like AI is never going to feel your laughter. Like AI is never going to be your phenomenology. Your phenomenology will always be your phenomenology, right? So there's also, in phenomenology, that's all... That's all kind of more energy constrained because you tend to know that if you're doing something in a virtual reality, you know it's virtual reality, so it doesn't strike you with the same emotional force as someone actually saying that they love you as opposed to your Tamagotchi girlfriend. Um, I don't know. You know, it depends, I suppose. Uh, but 
there's something also here where AI can never give you the feeling of, of learning something interesting. AI can never give you the feeling of feeling loved, right? AI can never give you the feeling of realizing something. So there's also something here about phenomenology that or experience itself. Not just the subjects of experience, but experience itself that comes to mind. So then is there something about quality of experience that these organize, like the, these organizations exist to increase your ability to have a quality of experience, which then if they do that, also increase the quality of the experience of the organization itself, thus making you want to belong to it, thus giving you meaning, thus making you belong to it, creating that feedback loop again. Um, and then the question would be, is there, a, is there a feedback loop between physical activity, all of the stuff, blue collar stuff we're talking about in the increase of the ability to have a quality of experience? Do you have better qualities of experience if you get outdoors more, is almost what I'm asking. Does living in the cubicle lower your quality to experience the world? Like your very ability to have quality experience, does that go down? because of the cub cubicle and white collar work? Do you have higher quality of experience the more you use your entire body? I don't know. That would be something that I also wonder. If so, then AI would actually lead to a pressuring us in the direction that increases the quality of experience. Yeah, that, that's definitely the core move for me in this conversation is like realizing that AI is the epitome of a certain ontological mode and it's going to negate that whole it's going to at least strip away all the bullshit from that mode that we've created yes all of the all of the bullshit jobs that have come out of the information age are just going to be gone wiped out and yes. we're going to be pushed back in the direction of our bodies and the world and material like actually w working with matter and yeah so th there's like something really beautiful and profound in that and I, I really sense like an opportunity there and so then it becomes something like okay there's going to be a window of opportunity because I, I don't think the absurdity is high enough yet I no. think no we're like we're we're bridging on it but I, I think it's going to get a lot worse and it's so there's going to be a sort of sweet spot where the absurdity is is strong enough that people are being completely pushed out of that mode by it but not so strong that it's sort of literally got its tendrils into people and i mean it does to some degree already but so then it's okay there's there's a great there's a great tragedy coming there's a great trauma coming in the meantime let's move into physical space into personal space and begin cultivating the the intimacy and the web of meaning and value that is going to be the beauty that in that window of opportunity and in the moment of the tragedy allures the shining light of that will allure people out of the cave that we've been constructing for the last 100 200 years and that sort of i guess what's interesting is like how does forests substrate argument come into this because mm. we're sort of proposing there that ai is going to ramp up and then it's going to polarize a bunch of people and that's going to be the systemic transition but will there be a couple of psychopaths that continue ramping up will they be able to effectively comp will their will their form of influence be able to trump the form of influence that is the beauty of the real and it's like maybe but the fact that they're going to be limited on energy they won't be limited informationally and in, in that form of intelligence but they will be limited energetically and therefore will their influence be able to control the masses who are now shifting towards the beauty is maybe that's the question um excellent so so definitely, I really like this. So there's a few things. So basically, AI seems to be the logical extreme, extreme of the technological thinking that concerned Heidegger that erased the being, capital B being, in favor of beings. What's interesting is that precisely the 
success of AI will be the moment possibly when it negates itself and unveils its supposed capital B being as only being beings with a lowercase b, and then everyone will go, oh my gosh, it's not actually capital B being, it's lowercase b being, oh, and then that negates AI and makes us more human, right? That is absolutely what I think could occur. Um, and actually, I would say in a very real sense, the problem with AI is that it isn't intense enough. It's precisely at the extremity of its success that it negates itself. This is very, and this is where Lacan, Zizek, and Hegel are so important is because the victory is the failure in all of them. It's precisely when you think that you've succeeded that it negates itself, thus bringing in the next phase of the phenomenological journey or the next paradigm shift, right? Mm -hmm. However, that assumes that in the process, you don't nuke yourself. And that is where you see the key to understanding for me, Hegel, is that history advances through basically paradigm shifts, precisely because it eventually reaches a moment where what is thought to be the end of history is in fact the end of that history and beginning of the next paradigm. But Hegel wrote before nukes. Hegel wrote before massive interconnectedness that could cause a breakdown in a very profound way. However, here's the issue. I don't think Hegel's wrong, but wait a minute, if Hegel's right about history, then that would mean that for us to have the next paradigm shift, it's going to require precisely the, the failure of a great success, the negation at a moment of triumph. And that would be the triumph of AI is required, according to Hegel, for history to go into the next paradigm shift. But this history is one that could blow itself up before it gets there. So that's the contingency. Whereas before nukes, perhaps what Hegel's describing is more inevitable, that you're always going to have the next paradigm shift, which in this case would be quality of experience. Quality, we'll just say. Um, but now it's not given. And that's where things may have changed, or maybe we shouldn't worry about it because who are we to think that we can have history develop differently than how history has always developed, right? Um, who are we to think that we could... I don't know, change human nature in a manner that it doesn't need to reach that failure, right? Well, I don't know. You know, this this is where you have an interesting problem. Um, don't know. Um, however, what's what's critical to note is that what AI will seemingly bring to an end is the conception of, and I really like what you were saying, because AI will unveil that human beings can't possibly be just brains on a stick. And so all the bullcrap will go out of the way and we'll have to say, oh, that conception of human ontology is wrong. So what's right? And what's right seems to have something to do with quality of experience, the ability to experience at a certain quality of intensity, right? Okay. What are things that increases the human capacity for higher qualities of experience? All right. Well, if we go back, oh, in the past, they used to talk about culture, the ability to be a culture person, art, freaking creativity, interactions, relationships, friendship. Like David Hume is basically like an Aristotle. All these cats are like Cicero. They're all like, hey, basically to be humans to have friends. You don't have friends, you're screwed. Um, AI, I assume, can't have friends. It can have networks, but I assume those aren't quite friends. And friendship is not a brain on a stick. Like, brains on sticks can have networks, but humans can have friends, right? And so there's something about culture, because everything in culture was basically about a cultivation of friendship. The reason you would read the novels, read the music, is have this kind of shared, this ability to have a quality of bringing yourself to other people, and they would bring to you as well, that would then create a certain quality of experience right? That wasn't merely transactional, but a feeling of we are almost drinking the wine of the world. Like the world is a kind of wine and we are using our time in a manner so that we can drink up of it per se, that we can really experience it in a kind of fuller way. But it's not a hedonistic. It's not just a pleasure experience like, oh, let's go feel good or whatever. No, no, no. This is the pleasure that requires the conditioning and work of being able to enjoy the wine. Mm -hmm. The wine of the world, you could even say, right? 
So there would seem to be a reclaiming, and I'm not like talking like everyone needs to go back and study the arts or whatever, but the spirit of that argument that used to be embodied in culture seems to be what these organizations will have to do because it's some sort of quality of experience. Now, I would argue that wrestling and sports can increase quality of experience. So this is not, this is not like an arts talk where we're saying everyone necessarily needs to go to art museums. We're saying that there's something about, there are certain things humans can do that increases their ability to have quality experiences. And that that is what it means to be human. That if you can't have quality experiences, you are not human, okay? Or you're missing out on what it means to be human. So what is it? Now, this is the question. What is it that makes something feel quality? What is it that makes something feel special? Like when you have a night where time speeds up and you're like, where did the hours go by? Or you look up and you're like, oh my gosh, I was writing for two hours. I didn't even know it. Or you had a good, what is it that makes that hmm. happen? Is it reading novels? I know a lot of people. So, you know, it's not that because I know a lot of people who have read a lot of novels who are, who it sucks. It's not fun to be around them. <laughs> They're like English PhDs. They know all about the arts or whatever. So it's not that. But there's something that creates a quality of experience that feels like it frankly could go on forever and it wouldn't ever get boring because the concept of time goes away. Now, something like this sounds like the flow state, but I'm not sure if it's just the flow state because that seems to be like an intense specialized experience of this, but there's some, it seems like there's a way to have something like the flow state, state that actually defines your everyday life right? It's not just when you're in the zone, but also just going through life where there's a certain sort of part of it that occurs in the flow state, but is not exactly equivalent to the flow state. Maybe it's more distilled, more diluted or something like that. Please. And I'll just jump in because there's something very alive here and that it's not a metric. That's why it's not the flow state. Exactly. It's actually just the dynamic experience of reality itself yes unfolding with all of these complex elements coming and going in a sort of symphony and i think the other negation that is going to be even more sort of perhaps profound and existential will be the negation of seeking pleasure yes 100 100 very good there's an arg there's an argument you can put forth that okay well what will happen is we'll have AI and then we'll have VR and then AI plus VR, we're going to be able to have any experience we want, any time. And this is where speed comes back in. Things like tempo and difficulty and resistance, virtual reality is seeking to eliminate that because again, it's an imbalanced value system. And I think like somehow partnered with this like machine mode, machine also couples with this sort of like maximization of as like ease or something, something like a pleasure. And so we're going to have the negation of that. And then this re-realization of actually all of these constraints as they are, are, are perfect. And in, in that definition of perfect, they were using earlier, like the very fact that we face these resistances, the very fact that we have all of these limitations that we're trying our best to exceed, to escape our condition. Actually, our condition is the thing that is homing us. And the place where we will feel most healthy and most alive is right here inside of that. That's very interesting. So AI will negate autonomous. I'm going to use the terms I like to use in like the truism of the rabbit. So please. AI will negate autonomous rationality. And it will also negate autonomous pleasure, which would negate autonomous entertainment. So those are out the window. So whatever the metric of this organization is not that. Okay. So the quality of experience. What's very interesting is the word I want to use is spirit, where AI is going to make us more spiritual. And it's hard to use that word, though, because people hear that and they go religious and Christian and Jude or, or something. And it may fit into that. But more spiritual spiritual and spirit you know sports spirited they have a lot of spirit oh they're taken up there's like ale ale with the bulls like spirit like that experience of ole ole like elizabeth go like something takes over something takes over something something is there that is be something is there now 
mysticism, the real, the getting. I want to use the word spirit, but I hate, I hesitate to use the word spirit because it's so weighted. The getting, like this, this gettingness where you, you get it, you see it all unfolding and you're getting along with it. There's a getting, this capital G getting. If I just were to make up a word on the spot, that may not be the best word, but I'm looking for something. There is absolutely something about the joy of the getting that is far greater than pleasure and that is not reducible to rationality. And it would seem that if we don't nuke ourselves, AI will actually force everyone to either get it or they're done. And that creates a certain pressure to condition yourself to be the kind of being that can undergo that getting. And that getting is a certain way of carrying yourself in the world that one, there's no subject object divide. Like that's gone because you're, the getting includes you and that, and it's all getting along together in a certain gettingness. I'm saying getting a lot now. Uh, and it's a quality of experience that then makes you glad you're alive. That seems important because what is something we're going on with air? It's like, what's the point of human beings? Well, because of the getting. Like if you didn't exist, you wouldn't be getting. This is interesting as well because you can never as a human being escape the problem of experiencing in a sense. You're always experiencing, right? Like no matter what you do, you are experiencing. And in a sense, what the, uh, the original trauma in psychoanalysis is the fact that you didn't ask to start experiencing and you were just forced to be born. You didn't ask to be born, you're just born. And so the original trauma of psychoanalysis is the fact that you must experience. I like to put it like that versus birth because when you say birth, it, you're, you're losing what that means. The fact that you are forced to be born means you must experience. And there's a way in which the one we, the reason we want to get back to the womb in a Freudian sense is precisely because of the problem of having to experience. I did not ask to experience pain. I did not ask to experience alienation. I did not ask to experience and now I am. But what if you were glad for experiencing? Like, what if you were glad for experiencing? Then that would seem to cover up the original wound of being born. And it would seem as if, if human beings are going to make it, we have to overcome that original trauma. And I'm using a lot of psychoanalysis here because I actually think it's the best framework now. If we're talking about what it is to be human, well, then you're born. Like, there's something about birth and de fundamental definition as together. We seem to have tried to heal the original trauma with rationality. You know, oh, we're rational. So it's good. We'll figure everything. We will figure out how to live with the fact that we're born, right? We'll make a perfect world. That's out. Okay. Well, we'll deal with the fact that we were born by endless pleasure. You know, we'll have a lot of orgasms or something like that. Well, that's out because we see how empty it is and how miserable people are who have endless. That's not going to work. All right. No sex robots. No sex robots. And that would be pretty boring, I guess. You know, that would just suck. Um, so you're still left with the problem of experiencing. And one of the reasons why AI scares us is because we're like, we're going to have to experience a world where we feel like we have no reason to exist. Like AI can replace us and it's going to be faster than us. So we're going to have to experience a feeling of worthlessness. So it's a fear of a certain quality of experience, right? It's a fear of, or I'm going to lose my job and be poor and have to experience not having money. Right. So there's something about experience that is actually at the heart of the problem of the fact that I, as a human, didn't ask to be born. And now I'm going to have to experience having no purpose because AI is doing everything. So what if you are able to cultivate the getting, which is a joy in experience itself, that would that would heal the trauma of birth. Right. And the organization that could make experience a getting because maybe we'll say that, like the, the question is how to make experience getting, which would be spiritual, spirit, okay? So the metric seems to be that organizations need to cultivate the, the negation sublation of experience into getting. So you negate experience, but in that experience, it becomes getting, which is a quality of life and phenomenon and world. So the metric is the so the metric of success for these organizations must be to the degree that they can change people's experience into getting. 
And of course, that makes room for individual difference as well, right? Because everyone will get and experience their own getting in their own way. Oh, and difference will now be experienced as part of the getting. So now you've dealt with the problem of, of, of difference that we talked about at the beginning, right? So you turn difference into a getting, into spirit. I, I keep going between. But so you deal with that problem while simultaneously making room for individual difference and dealing with the original trauma of being born. So then the question is the following. What does an organization need to do to help people have experience, have, undergo the getting as opposed to experience as trauma? Does that make sense? 100% really well said. And I think one way of thinking about how do we get into this position in the first place is because this current paradigm is not the first time we have had to put up with that original trauma. Yes. It's, it, it's been with us since the very beginning. And you could just, you could say that we are now at a time where our capacity to complete ourselves, the death drive is now at its all time strongest form. But that will be hopefully the very negation that puts us pushes us into our all time strongest yes. getting. A and I think when we think about like what what is the organization or coming back to this question of governance, I think we can actually nuance the question around governance into thinking more about fractal scales, starting all the way in the individual stack down at these like relations between say cells and then we we're building up through these different modes I, i'm referencing more of a henriquez model here yeah. and then we break out into the world into the interpersonal space first in something like a family unit or a friendship unit then into a community and then up into something like a symbolic order and it's not a question of like what is so much what is the like metric at each of those la layers, but rather like this dynamic process of moving through these layers, through these scales in a way where they are constantly relating to each other and informing each other based on the type of mode that is native to them. For example, the, the native mode to the largest scale, which is where we typically think about governance, is the symbolic. Right. It's where we have rule sets that we can impose. Whereas at the level of, what I would refer to as the microscopic, where we're dealing with the interiors of an individual, we now have to work with a different mode, which I would call choice, which factors in the subjectivity and the particularity of the individual. And so we're sort of, and then this mesoscopic scale where you're working now with a relationship between subjective choices, a relational field, and then a rule set coming down from on top. And they're constantly talking to each other and the highest layer is the slowest moving because it is the most concrete. And then the 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 layer of the interior and the subjective choice is an in the moment constant becoming. But it's it's a traumatic experience being in that mode, which is why we try to defer to the other and to the relational field, because by having to choose, I'm having to be conscious, which means confronting the very fact that I am separate from the whole yes. and therefore constantly collapsing all of that potential of the one into, into a choice that reflects the fact that I am finite. And so it's like this, like developing this spiritual maturity to face the trauma of choice over yes. and over again, whilst being in relationship to others and some sort of symbolic order that was very well put there is something about not being able to face the trauma of choice that that um short circuits the getting um like because you have to make a choice and if you make a choice and then you're like or one if you're unable to make a choice then you can't control your life and you're pulled along so you lose the getting but also if you make a choice and then you're nervous or like overwhelmed by, oh, I made that choice and now I'm responsible for it. Now the getting is short circuited. So there's something about choice, the ability to choose in a manner that does not disturb the getting that seems very important. 
And then you have to participate in the system that you're in, in a manner that does not short circuit the getting. And also the on high has to operate in a manner that does not inhibit the getting, which then makes me think that it all has to work like the, the doorknob in Heidegger, which in Heidegger, the doorknob's invisible until it breaks, and then you notice it. Like you don't notice it until it breaks. Like you just use the doorknob, right? So a successful system seems to be kind of invisible in a way that functions as the necessary backdrop so that the getting can operate without, say, being infringed upon or interrupted because you can't get clean water, for example, or because, you know, your neighbor is like stealing your property or something, right? And so there is something about maintaining a quality of experience, the getting, that would seem to be that the operation of these systems then is to function in a kind of strange invisibility, like a working doorknob. It has, you, you, re you require the doorknob. If the doorknob is not there, you cannot open the door. So by invisible, I do not mean not there. The, the, metric, the metric of determining that they are working fittingly is to the degree they're invisible. Like you, de you determine that a doorknob works because you don't look at it when you use it. That's like, that's actually the evidence that it works. If you looked at the doorknob, that would mean it's not working because you reached and it's locked or something, right? So the metric of determining that the system works is invisibility <laughs> to the note that it does not infringe upon the getting. What does that mean? Uh, does that mean it, what is it creating then? What is the system doing? It is creating, well, that would seem to have something to, this gets into the topic of self-forgetfulness I like to talk about. Well, you forget yourself. It's not that you're selfless or self-ish. It's what Timothy mm. Keller talks about. It's where you can just not think about. You use your thumb without thinking about it, right? And so there's a self-forgetfulness that occurs. Um, it's, it's, it's how you avoid the ditch of self-ishness or selflessness. You do self-forgetfulness. And for Timothy Keller, and I think he's correct, the optimal relation to the ego is forgetfulness. You don't make a point to destroy it and you don't make a point to elevate it. You just forget it. You just use it because you have it. So likewise, there seems to be a system forgetfulness. Like the key is to not have a system be something you're overly focusing on, but also you don't make a point to tear it down or to ignore it, right? It functions and thus becomes kind of forgotten. And that means it works. What would it mean for a system to operate in a manner and for the rulers and leaders to operate in a manner where they hope they're forgotten? Most leaders, you know, you know, they operate in hopes to be looked at. Most teachers want to be observed as the teacher. So you would have to have leaders and representatives and people participating who are there precisely to vanish in being there. They are there to become invisible and to make the whole thing invisible so that you don't have to pay attention to it. And if you think about it, that's hmm. basically what a functioning society does. Like the roads work, like the job of the guy paving the roads is to make you like, Forget about the roads because there are no potholes. The guy who builds like the air conditioning in the restaurant, his job is to make you not think about the temperature because the air conditioning system works, right? Like in a very funny way, like so much of what we do as human beings in on the systems level is create things to be invisible, right? And to like forget themselves or to vanish. An inefficient system one is precisely one you think about all the time. And that is constantly... It's, it's constantly becoming the subject you choose. It's constantly becoming an object you choose as opposed to the background of choice. Like the system needs to be the background or the plane on which you are choosing um, as opposed to the thing you constantly have to choose. You know, the doorknob is supposed to work so I don't have to choose a new one or choose if I fix it or not, right? It's supposed to get out of the way of other choices. And those choices are the ones that incubate and make possible the getting, right? So there's something about forgetfulness, self-forgetfulness, forgetfulness, things going into the background that seems to be completely necessary for this getting we are describing um, to, to be uninfringed. And then the question, so does that make sense? So there's something about a kind of invisibility that almost seems part of this. Yeah, definitely. And I'll just add, it, it seems like we, neither want something that we forget entirely because that's the death drive that's the seeking for the eternal flow state that we disappear into but then we also don't want everything to become 
we don't want everything to break at the same time otherwise we experience a pure paralysis yes. because it's like oh everything's broken now I, i'm conscious of everything however it does seem like there's there's something about firstly there's the process of creation that requires a forgetting and a remembering and a dialectic and that's yes. like the when something needs to change it becomes conscious we deal with that and then it, it becomes unconscious physical. again right. but it does seem like there's also some kind of spiritual cultivation where over time as you become more comfortable with consciousness because yes. remember consciousness is traumatic yes but the degree to which i can hold more consciousness is the degree to which i can be in a richer experience yes. so not only are we in this dialectic of creative becoming we're also in this gradient of awakening if i can use a term like that sure. and it seems like there's there's a also a relationship there between as as i become more comfortable with consciousness I can engage in more kinds of creation because I'm less at risk of slipping into forms of unconsciousness that lead to the destruction of my species. Completely. Um, and it should be noted that you have to be conscious of the doorknob originally to put it there and then you forget it, right? So this isn't like saying that there is never time yeah, for yeah. the focus. And likewise, this is what's very interesting. Like you almost have, you're almost... The consciousness that un the subject that undergoes trauma could be better off than the subject that never undergoes trauma, actually, in a weird way. Or you get stuck in the trauma and have been better off if you never experienced the trauma. So there's this weird thing where you have no traumas here, trauma is like worse, but then like overcoming trauma is better. Like that's the highest kind of form of con and I think about this like. New, in Christianity, New Jerusalem is better than Eden, actually. But in order to get to New Jerusalem, you have to fall from Eden and have the cross and then get to New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem is actually a higher paradise than Eden, but it requires the trauma of the fall to get to, right? Um, and so there seems to be something like that going on, where if we could actually rise to the occasion of this problem, AI will force us to come through the consciousness of trauma to a mode of subjectivity that is better than the subject who never undergoes the trauma of AI. So actually AI, if we don't blow ourselves up basically, is going to possibly lead us to coming out of a trauma of which we are better, better subjects for coming out of, which would suggest that we would be more able to undergo the getting and that more people would be able to undergo the getting. Now here's the question. There's a few more questions now. Are people who are capable of the getting more naturally inclined to follow the game theory conversational dynamics that Forrest Landry was putting out? Are they more naturally inclined to interrelate in a constructive manner as opposed to an egoic manner, right? Because, you know, Forrest was talking about how basically we're screwed if people don't follow if people don't know how to have high quality conversations, you're screwed, right? He was making that point, basically. Yes, I agree. Here's the question. Are people who are undergoing the getting more likely to have high quality conversations? If you say yes, well, then you start taking care of these problems that are at the base of the systems, right? So the getting seems to be, in my view, increase the probability that people naturally, without like reading a document, they almost just kind of naturally and emergently start following the right way to do a conversation because the very getting itself leads to them living that way, right? So the getting leads to the subject carrying itself in a manner that is less likely to fall into destructive game theory dynamics, right? Do we think that's true? I think that's true, okay? So then the cultivation of the getting will naturally emerge to subjects that are more likely to make an organization work whatever structure it is, right? Now, some structures are better than others, but we cannot assume that every human being will follow the same structure. Some people will do a game B model. Some people will do capitalism as we know it. Some will do Forrest Landry, right? But if, if more and more people have the getting, regardless the system, there is a higher probability it will be less pathological than not. 
And it's also the case that there's a higher probability that people, as they encounter better systems, will change to those systems precisely because the getting makes them more adaptable in that manner, right? So it would seem that the cultivation of this getting would lead to all of that, actually, more than just having them read a document that says they ought to, like, here's the thing, if I like convince you that organizations are not gonna work unless we all follow a certain game theory dynamic, you still may not follow it because of some self-interest or maybe one day you're irritated or something, right? So the propositional knowledge of the dynamics necessary for an organization to run will not necessarily lead to those dynamics fo being followed unless it's emergent through a collect people having the getting of then leads them naturally to doing. So this is where it would seem that the getting is primary, right? Okay, so then the question is, so then... Does that mean in order to do the stuff that Mr. Laundry is talking about, you require the AI to cause the trauma that pushes a collective getting, and then you'll be able to do these organizations. But kind of if the point of these organizations is to arise before AI, because the AI trauma will be too much to actually lead to that, that would be a problem. So because it would seem like you need the getting first, right? So is that a problem? Um, I guess it depends on how severe you think the AI issue is, right? Um, or are you just going to naturally have to have a certain population that doesn't get it, a population that does, and then we just hope we don't nuke each other? You know, is, it, is this, is there no, let's put it this way, is there no way to remove the possibility of like the end game, like the game coming to an end because the AI gets ahead? You see what I'm saying? Like, it could be the case that there is no scenario where you can kick out that possibility, right? Maybe, maybe not. So that's, that's one thing I'm thinking about. And perhaps in keeping with a lot of the logic of this conversation, we actually don't want to get rid of that possibility. Because then you won't it's have to get like it. A... Yeah, 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 yeah. Put the imperative <laughs> to it. I, that's very good. Actually, it could be precisely the fact that it is so dire that then leads to the imperative of the spreading of the getting. That's nice. And then you start feeling excited. Yes. And then it's like, oh, that's the getting. Yes. So, and like, and I think we're sort of, this is already happening, but as AI ramps up, the getting and the happening will increase in its intensity as well. I would argue what we're doing right now is in service of the, the getting. getting. Yes. And I, maybe another point to add in here is we talked about these different scales and it seems like, Right now in the social order, the thing that is being marginalized is the mesoscopic layer. It's the community layer. It's the commons layer. But we can then infer that there's actually a danger there where we run the risk of idolizing that layer and negating the other things. And then we're going to run into a fresh problem. And I actually feel like I sense this happening in the collective to some degree where so I'm going to say we're overweighting that mesoscopic community layer. And like there's a lot of sort of defiance against the higher order symbolic order from these people who want to do intersuppositional yeah. things. So it's sort of like, like, yeah, I mean, and that that's bound to happen. And that's another tension that we have to sort of grapple with. But yeah. No, I think you're I think it is extremely important not to assume that um, the commons is better than the macro, you know, the big picture. Like, oh, if it's commons, it's good. And if it's macro, it's bad. Well, that that's quite dangerous because, you know, commons can be cults, right? Uh, you know, that, that could be bad. And also the, ma yeah. the, the, the big can precisely be what's creating the motivation and imperative to do the commons. And if it wasn't there, you wouldn't be forming the commons. So you, it's, you can't draw that separation uh you need to see it as all possibly a motivational ecosystem if i you know there, there, there's like motivation almost operates in a certain ecosystem like you need certain problems to then make you care like problems lead to innovations that wouldn't exist without those problems the the issue is just making sure the problem isn't so dire that it crumbles the innovation but but i think what you're saying you know a few things on this kind of excitement that you're describing 
Again, this is where I think Hegel is so good to suggest that ideas literally change the modes by which history operates. Like these abstractions, mm -hmm. like a, an intellectual conversation literally changes how history develops because it changes how you feel moving into history, right? And so if you have a certain mode so, of excitement... Like, literally what you see in Hegel is that if you have a mode of excitement going into history, that changes how history unfolds. And literally, like the very feeling that AI is going to kill us all could be precisely what leads us to acting in a manner that means AI kills us all, because then we act in a manner that is self-destructive, right? So it is really important to not, it, it could easily be AI that leads to a spreading of the getting that then makes people more receptive to these models being made in the, com the commons. And if it, it could be precisely the meta crisis that leads to an increase of the getting that leads people care about these different communities. So it, it's important to not assume that community is good, meta crisis is bad because you have an, ego, an ecology of motivations that are in operation. So you, you, can't, you can't make the claim. And the thing is, so then like the thing that's interesting is what is it that occurs with the getting? Like what, what, is, what is the getting in a sense? Like what is that? Well, um, it, it seems, so it seems to have something like, what does it feel like to have a getting? Like, what are you feeling when you have a getting, right? Part of it seems to be where you are fully engrossed. You want to be here. You want to go deeper. You want to keep going. There's a feeling of knowing what to do, knowing how to spend your time. There's, there's something, well... So I think in psychoanalysis, it's now, that's where it comes to desire, right? We can get into Lacan, the big other, the objet a, all these fancy French terms, where, and, and Gerard, right? Where there's this question of desire and wanting what the other has and different things like that. For me, I personally read, and I actually heard Peter Rollins say something similar to this, and I think it's really important. I think the key to mimetic desire is not so much that human beings want, we look at the other and what we desire is to desire. It's not so much the object. We just like the feeling of wanting something and having something to do and actually like wanting to be around. Like the feeling that seems to define the meaning crisis is in the mental health crisis is a like, I don't know what to want. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to carry mm. myself in the world. I don't know what I should experience or what it means that I'm experiencing. And the word means come in, but I think it's important I really, like, when we talk about the meaning crisis, I think it's kind of a quality crisis, like a quality of experience crisis. Like, the, like, like, you could have a purpose. Like, your purpose is to take care of your family. You have a meaning. You're a dad, right? But if that feels empty to you, then it's not a meaningful meaning, if you grant me that double phrase, right? So when I listen to Viveki, I assume what he's talking about, and I think he is talking, I'm not saying he's not saying this. He's, like, the word meaning is quality of experience basically <laughs> like he's talking about a certain quality he is the getting crisis basically it's not like the meaning crisis is not as i understand it a i can when someone has a worksheet and it says what's the meaning of your life it's not being able to fill in the blank that's not overcoming the meaning crisis <laughs> the you know that is not that the, overcoming the meaning crisis is overcoming a lack of getting and the gettingness seems to be well, and so this is important. When we say, well, if it is the case that what we desire is primarily desiring, well, then it's not actually desire that we desire. It negates itself in that very act, right? It's not really a thing you desire because you have the thing that you want, right? So what you're at when desire, if desire is actually after desire, just having a desire, then what it is after is a certain pushing you forward, a certain going, a certain getting getting it getting it wants to get life you want to wake up in the morning and be like yes like a yes to life it would seem that what we desire what we want and of course when we desire what the neighbor has it's not really what they have that they want but we imagine that the neighbor must have a desire to be alive because they look like they're after something turns out they don't either they are just after an object but in that space you can interpret them as in fact that, right? 
And it's really, a, it's really something that they don't have either necessarily. In fact, if they're after an object, they probably don't have it either. But what you see is an action, you see a going, you see a getting it. And I, getting it's funny because you're getting it, like riding a horse, getting up, getting it, you're getting it. And it's like, what happens is what you're actually wanting. In, in Lacan, there's a difference between desire and drive. Okay, where drive and desire are not the I'm same familiar. thing. Actually, I think desire is a drive. <laughs> like, actually, we have a desire drive. And what the desire drive exists to do is to give us drive so that we're driving. Because then here's the key. Desire seems best when it's invisible, just like the doorknob. When you don't think about the fact that you're designed, you just are. You just are. You just are. Like being, like alive, becoming. You just are. And so the critical mode of game. So what's interesting is that when desire becomes invisible, ergo desire is a drive. You as a subject become invisible. Thus the I object, thus the I, the subject object divide vanishes. The world is there in a very Heideggerian kind of being. So therefore the getting occurs. So the getting seems to occur when desire desires desire and it gets it. Therefore desire becomes a drive. Therefore, you and your very desire become an invisible object. You really don't think about what it is that you want. You just want. You just are. You just become. You just engage in the flow of the experience itself. You, the becoming is. And that now, we're, now it's very interesting from a meta-analysis of the conversation itself. Now what we are talking about is something that does seem to fail language, right? There's a certain failure yes. of language. That's good because if it fails language, that means AI can't compute it. Like the very fact that there's a struggle of language now suggests something that is in fact getting getting there. Because this, if there's you can't no language symbol. it. Yes. There's no symbol that will actually represent the getting. The getting is a, it, it's this dynamic, partially subjective experience, but one knows it when one is yes. in it. And that means it can't be captured in a Deleuzian sense, nor can it be computated. And if, and if it yes, cannot be yes. computated, well, then it's human by definition. And, and also, oh, in that very act, it would prove that human computation is not merely rational. Uh, because if it was, then the AI could do it. So if it is possible for human beings to undergo experiences of which cannot be languaged, then that would mean that humans aren't brains on sticks. So that's a negation too of it, in addition to the existence of the AI. So, so then the, the metric of these organizations is the increase of experiences that humans cannot put into words. <laughs> the metric is the yes. increase of yes. ineffability. So the metric is the increase. Does its members, in, do the members of the organization increasingly gain the, the ability to undergo the ineffable? If so, the organization is a success is successful. It is fitting, and humans can belong in it because only human beings can undergo ineffable experiences. Now, you could counter and say the animal undergoes an ineffable experience. No, no, no. The lack of language is not the same as ineffability. Okay, so you know it's it's like um, mm. the lack of war is not Free the same trends. as peace. Yeah, you see, like the lack of war is not peace. Peace is different from the lack of war, right? So likewise, an animal like. Their ineffability is not the same as an animal, even though it seems to be the failure of language requires there to be a language to fail. Okay. So you have to be capable of a language to fail, but it is, and that would be Hegelian though, because failure is the sublation. So the, mo so the experience of a failure of language would be the negation sublation that would suggest the essential human and therefore would be the metric by which the organization should center on. And that would seem to be well, obviously, we're talking intrinsic motivation now. Uh, so the cultivation of the human to be their own wheel in a wheel, my favorite topic. And motiv intrinsic motivation is not human's quality of experience deeply tied to their motivation. Like, they're very, and motivation is not, is not the same as meaning in the sense of the meaning of my life. Motivation is the invisible doorknob. You're just going. You're just becoming. The moment you talk about motivation, it's not itself. Like, motivation is a is the getting and the going. And if someone stops you and says, hey, what are you doing? Oh, I, I guess I'm writing. It's almost like the name of the game is to just find yourself writing, find yourself running, finding yourself in a relationship. Like just in the sense of, oh yeah, I do have kids. Like you're just, oh, oh yeah, I guess so. When someone asks you to put it into rational terms.
I really like the finding part because that's the awakening moment yes. where yes. it's not only am I in the thing, but I'm having the experience. Yes. There's sort of like, so we, we talk about the getting and then we kind of immediately want to make this move to give some ontological layer privilege over what the getting is originating from. Right. Like there's something intuitive in wanting to do that. But I, I think when, as we've just expressed, the getting will always be beyond words, but we can kind of, it seems like we can increasingly nuance the dialogue around the getting yes. and explore different symbols in a way that increasingly creates a more complex symbolic yes. representation of the getting and thereby feeds it back to us in a way that's more relatable, yes. more palatable. And makes us better at validated. conditioning. It makes us better at conditioning for the getting, conditioning ourselves for so the getting. Totally. And maybe we want to distinguish between the way we explain the ver the getting versus the way we train the getting, which would then be another translation between the the like formal logic of the getting versus the like mythical structure that brings the getting online within one's nervous system. Mm. And I think one of the nuances we could make around the getting is again, we could we could use this model where we have the layers of the individual, these sort of ontological layers, and then also these relational scales beyond the membrane of the individual. And it's almost like something has to be happening at each one of these layers out into all of these scales for the getting to be occurring. Right. So we've got something experiential occurring at the level of the consciousness. Then we have something motivational happening at the level of the behavioral investment system and then we have something symbolic happening at the level of the justification and then we have something relational occurring at the interpersonal and then we have something gov something happening at the level of governance and rules and sort of like all of these are able to feed into each other to create the getting and the getting will be in part universal but then also part yes subjective so it's sort of and there's this constant conversation going on between these layers these scales in order to not only maintain the getting but to evolve the getting yes. in its own becoming yes Magnificent. well I, a way i think about it is um if you have like a, a a crater for a media walk you can never see the media but you can walk around the crater to get a sense of its size its impact and what's going on the, the meteor is always gone or meteorite i always get those confused but you can walk the crater you can go the outline and the outline has value so likewise it seems as if rationality and sort of the thinking you can trace better and better outlines and the better and better the outline the more you're actually able to experience the getting or have confidence of the getting or be able to articulate the getting maybe to share it with other people to inspire them to train themselves like the better your outline of the getting the better you might be able to articulate it to inspire people on their, their own to train themselves to undergo the getting because that that seems to be the move like the reason in my opinion Basically, one of the main functions of rationality and logic and all of that, in addition to the mediation of the instincts, as our dear Hegel puts it, is it is inspiration. Like the better if if mm. if you're able to make ideas come alive, then they become motivational. And if they're motivational, then the person they're life changing. Basically, if ideas are not motivational, you fail. Like that's not the role of ideas. Like the role of idea like ideas. I don't want to say must be inspirational, but there's something like ideas are always, one should always be in the business of ideas to inspire. I'm not saying every conversation, I'm not saying every sentence, but it's to, ideas should always be presented in a manner that convinces the person that ideas matter and I ought to put them into practice. <laughs> like if ideas are presented and they don't do that, then they sure as heck didn't make it to the nervous system, right? I mean, they sure as heck did not make it to the emotional center. So the better you trace the outline of the getting, the higher the probability there's an inspiration there to undergo the getting or for one to con condition themselves for the getting. This would suggest that the function of rationality is gifting, basically. Like you are, you're trying, like you engage in mm. philosophy to gift, like to give gifts. And if you're not doing that, then you're not, doing something fitting for philosophy, right? You're not doing something fitting for rationality. So then it would suggest that maybe, 
maybe the unique, maybe the unique way humans can use rationality is frankly as gifts. Maybe AI cannot use rationality as a gift. Because if the gift is for the getting and only humans can undergo the getting, um, except an AI that is human, and we already talked about that, um, well, then the unique then the un then human rationality may in fact always have a unique characteristic that AI could not replace because AI can't do the gifting. And if humans though can use rationality to outline the gifting, that would mean there is a function for human rationality that is unique because it is in service of the gifting, okay? So rationality is gift for giving, but that would mean all rationality and philosophy that is not a gift is negated. Like we've talked about all these problematic autonomous. So that's all out the window. Autonomous rationality, autonomous pleasure is out the window. So likewise, what we see here is that the only rationality that humans should really be engaging in is gifting rationality, right? And so then a function of these organizations is the cultivation of gifting rationality. Rationality is gift because that's in service of giving. So, so that's a kind of thinking that then is unique, that then it will be imperative for the human to emphasize and to become skilled in. That, that's really good. And I, I think that actually what I hear in the gifting move is actually using the human to bind the AI to the meaning that we have evolved to experience. Yes. Sort of like on its own, it's just tracing, it's just arbitrarily tracing lines around nothing yes so sort of like you don't have a meteor until you have the experience of a meteor that can then be put into the frame for the ai yes and i think maybe what the hope is for some people with ai is that they will trace around the meteor so in so much detail that the tracing becomes the media. Yes. This, yes. I think that's like the, the like false mm. belief we're importing. Mm. And actually for that to happen, it wouldn't just be that it would have to trace around it perfectly. It would literally have to then be simulating the entire reality in yes. order to have that level of detail. Exactly. And anything short of simulating the entire reality, it will not be the thing itself. No, no. that's excellent. And therefore it's, it's sort of like that bridge will be necessary so long as the ai remains disconnected from the evolved meaning and we believe that it will be disconnected from the evolved meaning until it at least has a body and a boundary and the ability to do relevance realization which we don't know will necessarily be possible so it's sort of like that role of bridging is the gift that's excellent because i think that's exactly right like ai it is exactly like we think if it can walk the crater enough from the walking of the crater, it can create the meteor. But of course, to do that, it would have to simulate all of reality. So rationality as gift for the gifting would be a unique human characteristic. I guess you could say apathetic rationality. That's come out at the net. Like apathetic is that kind of nothing that is God, apathetic God. It's a nothing, but it has mm. a fullness there. So if one wants to make the move and talk about apathetic rationality, can be the gift which inspires the getting. That seems to be uniquely human. That seems nice. to be what humans can do that AI cannot do. I think that's fair to say. I think that's fair to say. Um, that being the case, then the metric of the organization is the cultivation of that. And then, of course, would be, how do you tell if that's being said? Well, you would gauge it by the inspiration. <laughs> you gauge it by the getting. You would gauge it by the motivation to be there and to be involved and to be part of. And you would be gauging the degree that you see people inspired by the conversations and interactions that are occurring, not necessarily, you know, to the degree that that shared inspiration is occurring, of which leads to an intrinsic motivation that is the mode of the getting. And that would seem to be the metric by which one could determine if life was being lived and if the organization was contributing to life. And so there's this, yeah, kind, of, this nice. kind of apathetic rationality with this rationality that's tracing something that then is the very tracing is a gift of which the seeing of that outline then inspires you to experience what was outlined. And that is the getting. Mm. And, and then that 
then who cares what AI does? <laughs> like at that point, you don't care. Like, great. It's doing our taxes. Great. It's doing all this crap we don't want to do. Uh, because now we can focus on the cultivation of that getting and that experience of which then here's the key. Let's say you get the getting from writing novels or something. You can say, well, AI can write novels. It cannot write the novels according to which I undergo the getting. Like you see what mm -hmm. ends up happening. Like who cares if it can do the novels because the novels are not primary. The, the, the art is not primary. Like the, the artistic product is not primary. The process is primary because it is the process of which is the experience of the getting. And that seems critical. You know, we talked earlier about slowness and all the different things like humans can enjoy process. I don't know if AI can enjoy process. AI like process is what you get through. AI exists to accelerate process, but the human here can find the getting in the process. In fact, the getting is process and process is basically relation, right? I mean, relation process is relation unfolding in time. Whenever one talks about a process, you're talking about a relation unfolding in time. Like process is the temporal word for this more spatial relation, right? And so the getting is the process. And so then what ends up happening is you go, well, the reason I'm writing the novel, like the novel is, is simply, the writing novels is simply the process in which the getting unfolds. The fact that AI can write novels is irrelevant because the the novel isn't the product it's the process of the undergoing of the writing of the novel and then other and then the uh, and then of course there's simply the fact that um the, the likelihood of an ai writing your novel exactly word for word is like zero there's no chance of this so your novel is going to be unique and your friends are probably going to read want to read your novel not the AI novel. So there's still going to be people who want to read it, but that's not going to be primary. It will be the intrinsic motivation. Now just expand this to every field. Hiking, building houses, doesn't matter, living, walking, sitting on the freaking porch. It's all the same. It all has, mm. it all functions as opportunities of getting, of which rationality is, apathetic rationality gets you to undergo. Do you know what else it's going to negate? It's gonna gonna negate people's attempts to become the one. Oh, so pe people, if you really go into it, it's like why do people write novels other than they're getting and other than so that their friends can have a meaningful experience? Because they want to become the writer, which we already Excellent. know is an impossibility. So there's actually another benefit in this, in which this this I there's a sort of uh, fetishization of stardom in this modern world and ai will also negate the ability for people to become stars because it will be able to and i mean maybe it won't yeah may, maybe it will i'll go with the point actually uh, it's sort of like it will be able to do all of these it will be able to produce product faster and potentially even better from a like on mass consumerist stimulation basis but it won't be able to generate the meaning of reading your friend's work exactly so you could argue that it will write a better novel that would just for pure pleasure people would prefer to read but because we're also negating pleasure we'll now end up wanting to read our friend's novel because it's not about pleasure and therefore we also will no longer be able to become the writer because the ai will be better but that will actually also be a positive transition as well that's really <laughs> freaking good um ai will negate the big other the object ah all of these things in psychoanalysis because <laughs> ai is always going to be better it's always going to be the star and so so then it's like why it's going to negate everything except the purity of the act itself like everyone's like you ought to write you know being a writer is not about being famous you're gonna find out if you mean that or not. <laughs> you know, you're gonna yeah. find it. You're gonna be the um the plausible deniability of the purity of one's motives will be out the window. And the point that you just made about the AI making better novels, but then the pleasure has been negated as well, will then make them useless. And so you're gonna read your friend's novel because your friend's novel 
it, it's about the relation, like the getting the relation. It actually then makes you center on also your re like you read your friend's novel because you really know your friend. Like if your novel wrote, it's like a diary, like even a fiction, like a, like the old man in the sea is not a diary, but it kind of is at the same time. Right. It's a way of knowing of which is really special and really unique because your friend wrote this. So this says something about what they think, what they feel and what they do. And so the relational, the novel as a object of relation and a individual person becomes extremely important, extremely primary. This is interesting to me because mm -hmm. often there's a lot of talk today of the death of the author. Like Kafka doesn't really matter. All that matters is the trial, right? And it's just an, it doesn't matter what Kafka intended because, you know, the, the book is alive on its own. Certainly true, but there's also a danger there um, where the novel has nothing to do with who the person is. There's really a sense in which AI will reverse the death of the the death of the author because the author wow. because the function of it as an insight into the author into the person will become extremely primary. So then the fact that art is not merely a product but a kind of avatar, if you will, of a person will become incredibly primary to us. And when we read a book, it will feel like holding somebody's heart. And so the relational aspect will actually become way stronger. And so then we may actually desire them more. Nobody reads novels anymore, really. Nobody really watches movies. I mean, they just go through Netflix. What if it is the case that actually people's true desire to say read novels or read books and actually do all of these different things or to participate in people's creative work shoots through the roof because the because the insight that it is actually a window into your friend to know your friend in ways you otherwise could not know will become incredibly clear because it's clearly not about publication or being a rock star anymore it's clearly about oh, something yeah. deeper that this piece right here feels massive i hadn't mm. seen this from this angle before mm. yeah and it, it just makes you think that everything human being like the death of the engineer the death of the business person the death of the author all of these things reverse actually like the the liveness of the person who made it explodes it may bring back walter benjamin's aura you know he talked about the loss of aura due to mass production Mass production is now, mm -hmm. mass production gets negated, right? Like the, the dehumanization of mass production is gone because it's AI production. It's not, ma it has nothing to do with the human being anymore. And so actually it may save the aura because everything humans do are, are not mass produced. Like if they, it's, it's, not, it's human. It is a, it's a complete window into the soul now. And so it actually brings back the aura in a very profound way because of the primacy of the craftsman in that. And then reading someone's novel becomes like, basically will be the case that you're like, there, there could be a social norm where if you don't read your friend's novel, you're not really friends because like, like the norm now is like, you don't have right. to do that. It's just a nicety, but now it's like, no, no, no. What if the social norm, like, what if the norm of what is expected and level of intimacy goes up? Mm. You see what I'm saying? Like right mm. now we can call people friends that are actually associates. What if AI forces the social norm of intimacy to skyrocket? Like there's a much higher level of intimacy that is the norm and that is expected precisely because AI has negated the, the different, like AI may basically kind of negate the kind of friend, not really friend. It may negate the associate and hopefully. actually, yeah, hope, like it would like actually skyrocket intimacy because it would skyrocket the conditioning of the getting of which then leads to higher intimacy and a caring about intimacy as opposed to association. Um, so then like the death of the, like AI could make people more like people, basically. Uh, like AI could basically lead to, AI could literally make humans more human, and which would be the exact opposite of what we tend to think. We think AI is going to like destroy the human. It literally could skyrocket intimacy, therefore skyrocket relations. And if humans are primarily relational, then the skyrocketing of the importance of relation would actually be for humans to be more human. Uh, and what humans would thus create would not be products, but windows into their souls. And that's what we would see it all as. We wouldn't see humans as creating products or goods or things to sell in the market. Right now, we, 
we primarily view humans in, as in the business of creating economic goods, right? That's the prime thing we think humans do. You go to work to make an economic good. No, the reason humans work is to make windows into their soul. That's what would happen. Like the point of work would be to create windows into the soul, uh, to actually create insights into the people making those things. And that would actually, well, that would definitely close the subject object divide. Like that's a big concern, right? Like so much of philosophy is about closing the subject object divide. Basically what you're saying here is that the object, the object is necessary for the revelation of the subject. Like if the, like the creation mm. of objects is mm. the revelation of the subject, because there's a way of knowing the subject can, that can only be known in the object that cannot be known in the subject. And so the, so the object becomes a kind of revelation of the subject. And that's how we would treat objects. Whereas right now we treat objects as economic goods, as things we use for our economic well-being. We do not think of objects as insights into subjects, but this would negate that mistake. And you would actually see what people create as insights into who they are. And so our relation to all these things would change. Wow, yes. And I think this is a perfect example of the way the idea can inspire. Yes. This very frame around yes. AI. Yes. And I guess th this is the work from now, or and it already was, but like continuing it's, what is the story we are telling about AI? Like we are creating, we are creating the 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 history of AI in the very moment as we're speaking this, and I I think that's really critical here. Is like the field the the field of the narrative itself around AI is going to have a non trivial influence on the direction that it heads and. It's what I love about this narrative is it's kind of like a negative. It's not telling us what AI shall be. It's telling us that regardless of what AI is, this is what we will become. And there's like a real sort of empowerment within that. I cannot overstate how much these dialogues about new communities and new ways of doing things need to lose the whole apocalypse air because that fails, like that fails. Like I, I am adamant when, you know, I have that. So we wrote a piece, it's at the end of Belonging Again, part one and it's called The Meaning Crisis as a Sign of Hope. It is extremely important that we understand that the meaning crisis is actually a sign of hope because the reason we're undergoing a meaning crisis is because we refuse to use old ways of finding meaning like racism, nationalism, bigotry, violence. We know, we actually do know how to make meaning. We can make meaning right now. We could just, you know, be racist and then be the top of a racial hierarchy. We have meaning suddenly. We are undergoing a meaning crisis, not because we don't know ways to gain meaning. It's because our standards have gone up. There is a hope in it. We are submitting ourselves mm. to the meaning crisis like Thomas frickin' Moore in A Man for All Seasons who won't betray his principles. Therefore, he won't grant the divorce to the king. He knows how to get out of jail. He just won't do it. The meaning crisis is not where humanity stumbled down some road, got locked in a room, and doesn't know how to get out. We are Thomas More in a prison. We could mm. leave whenever we want, but we are choosing not to because we are submitting ourselves to a higher standard and searching for a higher standard of meaning as opposed to the ways we have gotten meaning in the past. We are not doing that now. And so there is a hope in the meaning crisis. There is a hope. Likewise, if you tell people the reason we need new community and new ways of doing things is because of global warming, meta crisis, and we're all going to die, well, then we don't actually want to do new community. We're just doing it because we have to. Like, for frick's sake, you're basically saying we need a new mm. model of the human subject, not because we want to, but, but because if we don't, the frickin' mental health crisis will get worse. It's all negative. It's all, it's true. Yeah, like, all of these things are true. Of course there is these meta crisis dimensions. But you must always, 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 in your negativity, point to the opportunity of it. If you do not point to the opportunity in the negativity, the negativity will be an effacement. You will not get through it because never has humanity ever risen to the occasion when humanity didn't think it could rise. And if all you do is tell humanity that it's about to die, mm. then it rolls over. It is critical for us to understand that AI, if we surround it with the correct narrative and condition ourselves to meet that narrative could be the negation and sublation of an erroneous conception of man leading to a conception of human beings that is actually more able to undergo the getting that makes life alive 
AI doesn't have to be the end of us. It could be the beginning of something new. All things can be made new if only we would tell ourselves a story that even believes it's possible. Because if you go to bed every single night telling yourself a story that we're all going to die unless we do X, Y, and Z, well, what's the point? Because let's say we do X, Y, and Z. It won't be a year before something else comes around. And we'll just be living our life always looking for the emergency exit at the last minute. We're not doing these projects because we believe human beings can rise to be something greater. We're doing it so that we don't freaking die. And who wants to live a life where all you do every single day is avoid death? Avoiding death is not the same as being alive. And so we have to tell a story where AI may be opening an opportunity for a new form of life, a new form of undergoing something new, something more that we will be happy we went through. It will be a trauma that might put a star in our hand that will be signs of a resurrection as opposed to an effort to slit our own wrist. Because basically we talk about AI like we accidentally made something, thus committed suicide. Whoopsie, didn't mean to do that. What if instead of though, human beings only having a subconscious death drive, what if human beings actually have a life drive as well? Which AI, but it just turns out, it turns out actually, we need to stop thinking that life and death are opposites. Life and death are not necessarily opposite because the only way to live is to undergo death. The opposite of life is anti-life, the desire to have never existed, to have never been born, anti-natalism. There is no story of anyone who has ever lived a full life that did not undergo hardship, challenge, and death. Death is not an opposite of life, it is part of life. Death is not a thing in life. It is the horizon by which, by which life develops itself if life thinks it can rise to the occasion. And if it doesn't think it can rise to the occasion, then it is anti-life. Therefore, it will not be undergoing the getting. Therefore, it caves to the trauma of being born and wishes that it was never born. And that is antinatalism, a spirit of a kind of antinatalism that is coming forth. We talk about AI in the future in anti-natalist terms. We talk about these things as if it would be better if we wouldn't be born because the world's all gonna burn up, AI's gonna take all of our jobs and we're all gonna undergo a mental health crisis and we better form communities to avoid those things. That's great, but you still haven't convinced me why it's okay that I was born because it still feels like that was a mistake because all we're doing is running for the emergency exits. We must tell a story that makes it good that we were born. We must tell a story that makes life challenging, but a challenge that's worth rising to. If we do not, we can build whatever model, whatever system, whatever book, whatever philosophy, whatever we want. All of them will feel like distractions from the fact that it was a mistake that we are born. But if these things that we create and these lives that we live actually felt like windows into the human soul that wouldn't exist without AI because it got rid of all the nonsense and made us focus on what actually is human and what the points of these things are, if we could actually see our current situation as a possible negation sublation so that humanity today can rise to an occasion and prove that we've actually gotten better through history, that we've actually learned and we've actually arisen to challenges that we didn't think we could arise to, that sounds like we overcame the trauma of birth. That sounds like we actually are glad that we were born. And the only way to overcome the trauma of birth is to be glad that you were born. That's how you overcome it. So similarly, we need to be glad that AI is arising. We need to be glad in these challenges. Yes, they are challenging and they are hard, but if we cannot tell a story where challenge is good, then we will not ever find it good to meet the challenge. Because the next day there will just be another one and another one, and it will just be an endless story where we wish we were never born. But if we change the narrative, then all things can be new. And we might be able to live a life of the getting that we then give to others and inspire them to get it as well. Mm, nice. Maybe we could end with, there's always a risk in trying to do this after a four hour conversation. Yeah, I know. Maybe we could end with just some sort of final either feelings or just to kind of tie that all together because man like i'll just say like that was there was a lot there a lot got revealed to me in that mm. that i can say has been positively inspirational mm. and i think like where my mind was going just at the end of that was to we know that we need we need to know the truth of our situation and all of its dianists, but we shouldn't stop there. Like how many different narratives can we construct? How many different aspects of the situation can we reveal to ourselves? And in doing so setting up a sort of normative field for ourselves, like this pathway looks like it's leading here. 
this frame looks like it's leading here and sort of really, and this is what I've really loved about this conversation is it feels like we've really aired out a lot of the aspects. And I was really pleasantly surprised at certain things that were disclosed as some of these more like positively geared frames were being entertained because it's it'd be very easy to slip into the opposite which would be a like extreme sort of naive uh, conception that this is going to be a joyful ride which we both know it's not and i think we've very really got at that through this conversation but yeah i i definitely just this like becoming more human in the face of AI that strikes me deep and the the work that is being done right now by people to establish forms of organization that are going to be capable of healing people and bringing them into that experience of intimacy and the 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 art being the window into the the object being the window into someone's soul, all of that stuff. It just, yeah, I, I'm feeling, I'm feeling a sense of optimism in, in light of this sequence of ideas. So thank you. This has been a pleasure as, as always. No, I, it's been a joy, Tom. I always immensely enjoy speaking with you. Hence why I've kept you for four hours. Um, and the getting right. It's four hours. Who knew? Just, just like that. Um, it's amazing. Isn't right. it? I, I always, um, you know, in Christianity, you know, arguably the worst thing that can possibly occur is the death of God, right? And in Christianity, the death of God is at the center and turns out to be the salvation of the world, right? Like you think the worst of all possible things actually is the best of all possible things. The problem is now, since you know that, Je like the, the problem for the Christian though, is since they know Jesus is resurrected, they don't experience the utter terror of believing the universe is about to be cracked into because God is dying, right? Like, if God dies, the universe rolls up. It's gone, baby. And he's on that cross and he just breathed his last breath. But now you know he's resurrected, so you don't feel the, so you don't feel the terror. But we do feel the terror of the AI, right? We do feel the terror of the meta crisis, but we don't feel the hope because we don't know what happens afterwards. But we lose that emotion. You need that emotion. You need, like, real hope, like a really good story brings with it precisely at the climax where... All hope is lost is where hope is found. It's at the bottom of Pandora's box that hope comes out, right? We're not telling ourselves a story today like that. We're telling ourselves a story where we say we need to do X to survive. Uh, and then we'll see. Like, it's, it's a very negative story, right? It's like, yeah, God's going to die on the cross. I eh, hope the universe Well, yeah. No, there's no good that can come out of it. Like, AI is going to come along and maybe we could stop it. You know, the Metacrisis, maybe we could stop. There's this negative, but what, what is the resurrection that may come of this? Like, what is the, the life that will come of this? That's what we need to emphasize. It, like, what it, like, if we're, again, what it, Jesus, like, go tell them the good news. There's a story that's first. Your story is first. Like, what, the, what story are you telling people? I, if they don't have a good story, they're not motivated to do your system. They're not motivated to care about your model. They're not motivated to, to care about your frame because it's not a good story. People don't live if they don't have a good story. And, and so we, we have to tell a good story. We, we have to see these things happening as the rising action of a good story. I mean, if we don't, th the story's over. And so that has to be a focus. Um, we have to frame these things as opening doors that otherwise would be locked. You need scars to be openings that make possible the entering of life that otherwise would be locked outside. And so we have to tell that story. If we don't tell that story, then we're just going to die. But if we tell that story, then death can be a road to life. So we need to start telling that story today. Well, when fame gets negated and you're handing your poems out on the street corner, I'll take one. I look forward to handing to, it to you, Tom. Thank you, sir. Thank you, my friend. It's beautiful as always, Daniel. Always a pleasure.